All right, hello everyone. And welcome to this year's mock city council meeting. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So I call this meeting to order at 10.01. All right, so Mayor Pro Tem, will you like to lead us in the flag salute? Yes. All rise, place your right hand over your heart, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag Thank you, you may be seated. All right, thank you very much. And uh, Madam City Clerk, will you like to lead us in roll call? Yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Duran. Council Member Henderson. Here. Council Member Rodriguez. Here. Council Member Schmidt. Here. And Mayor Ziani. All right, thank you very much. And uh, do we have any public comments today? Yes, Madam Mayor, we have three public comments. Okay, can we go ahead and call the first one up? Our first public comment is from, Tim, or from Bob Barker's biggest fan, uh, followed by Joe Citizen. Well, this year's city council theme is Temecula fun. How are we gonna have fun today? IT guy, I need to zoom in. What do you got for me, what do you got for me? I need to be on TV, this is my time. Oh, there we go, there we go. Yeah, so here I am on TV yet again. City council, we're gonna have fun today. I uh, really, really, really appreciate all the fun activities that we do in the city, but I think we could have more fun. I think that we need to have a game show at the city of Temecula at a public hearing every single day, every day. We need to you know, bet on things, we need to get really excited, we need to zoom in, zoom out, and do all these exciting things at the city council hearing, right? Because this is the place to do that, right? Have fun, get more attention, woo! That's it. All right, thank you so much. Um, can we go ahead and call our second uh, public comment? Oh, okay. Our second pu public comment is from Joe Citizen and finally followed by Redacted Smith. Well, that's a uh, tough act to follow. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen to a concerned citizen. I'm here to talk to you about um, Temecula, one of Temecula's biggest problems, if not its biggest problem, and that is traffic. Uh, I will do you the favor of solving traffic in Temecula today. After today, we won't have to worry about it any longer. My proposal includes building a local metro uh, train to go around the city of Temecula to ease the, the burden, as well as a high-speed rail to go from San Diego to Temecula to Los Angeles. Where are we going to get the money for this, you might be asking. We have three untapped sources of income that we're not taking advantage of in Temecula. Number one, marijuana. <laughs> dispensaries, why can't we have dispensaries in this city? You've seen the great things it's done for other cities across the state and across the nation. Marijuana dispensaries, tax them, money coming out our ears. Second source of income, short-term rentals. <laughs> why can't we have VRBOs in Temecula? Tax those. More money, pay for trains, no problem. Third source of income, a plastic straw tax. Save the turtles, build a train. Problem solved, you're welcome. Thank you very much, some very great ideas right there. Um, can we have our third public comment? Yes, our final public comment is from Redacted Smith. Hello all, I'm here to talk to you about these helicopters that I keep seeing over my house. Sometimes they say police, sometimes they say news, but I know who they really are. 
on weekends. Camp Pendleton, they're in a battle with aliens. I can hear them from my house, my whole house shakes. <sighs> now I know some of you guys might, maybe one of you guys might think I'm a little crazy or maybe a danger to someone. But I, I like to tell you, it's, I haven't always looked like this. This is for my protection. This is since moving to Temecula. Like I, I have a picture of me that I found on the internet before I moved here. <laughs> I have no more hair. It's the brain scanners. It's just the government that's out to get me. That picture, is that you? <sighs> and it's wanted by the FBI? It's All right, thank you so much for those public comments. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move to city council reports. So we'll start off with my left uh, and give our report if we have any. All right, I'd just like to say a big thank you to the staff members and teachers today. And I'd also like to give a big shout out to Chaparral Boys Basketball for beating Temecula Valley for the first time in five years. Thank you, Council Member Schmidt, and we'll go ahead with, with Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, at this time, I would like to express my gratitude to all the people who made this opportunity possible to all of us, to the City of Temecula, City staff, and Council Members, in addition to my AP government teacher, Mrs. Arban. My colleagues and I are very fortunate to be given this unforgettable experience, and I'd most importantly like to thank my family for getting me where I am today as I'm preparing to graduate and pursue what lies beyond high school. Thank you. All right, thank you, Council Member Rodriguez. Uh, Council Member Duran. I would also like to express my gratitude to everyone here, the city of Temecula, and to the staff members and the city council members. This has been an incredible opportunity. Shout out to Mr. Slow, my government teacher. And also, at the end of March and beginning of April, Chaparral High School's actor troupe will be putting on a production of Sweet Charity, so please come down and watch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Duran and Council Member Henderson. Any reports? I'd like to give a big shout out to Mrs. Arbin for putting up with me. I'd also like to give a big shout out to Mr. Seacules because he's a beast. And I'd also like to give a big shout out to Mr. Skaggs because I have to. And I'd also like to say Great Oak Track is going to sweep this year. Thank you, Council Member Henderson. And I would like to also add that I want to thank Mr. Nevins for being an awesome AP government teacher, uh, Mr. Herbst for being an awesome IB World Religions teacher and AP World History teacher as he is retiring this year. And I want to give a big shout out to the mayor and uh, Council Member Sh uh, Schwenk for um, leading us these past two days and giving us more insight into local government. So thank you very much for that. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move on to council business. Um, and we're going to start off with community development. Good morning, council members and mayor. I am Kaylee Daniels Garber, the director of community services, and I will be introducing the topic of homelessness for the purposes of this meeting. Beginning this discussion, it is important to keep in mind that homelessness is not a symptom of a problem, but rather an outcome. Solutions targeting the symptom, homelessness, are most successful when paired with solutions targeting the root causes of that. In Temecula, we have seen the amount of people experiencing homelessness rise in recent years due to a variety of factors. These factors include the classification of certain crimes being shifted to misdemeanors. That results in people who had been arrested for some nonviolent crimes being released back out and having no resources to utilize and nowhere to turn to except to the streets. Additional contributing factors include the rising costs of housing, as well as a lack of mental health and substance abuse resources in the community. It is important that we as a city provide a safety net to help these people reassemble their lives. The city has been taking great measures to aid the homeless community. In 2019, the Community Services Department used a variety of grants to prevent individuals from experiencing homelessness, as well as to aid those who already are. We also developed the Homeless Outreach Strategic Model, increased street outreach, 
held community cleanup events, and provided specialized police training amongst other initiatives. The city works with multiple organizations committed to helping prevent and manage homelessness, such as the social work action group called SWAG and the homelessness outreach team called HOT. These groups do an excellent job of providing both early and chronic intervention for those experiencing homelessness. In 2019, the HOT team performed approximately 400 outreach attempts, and of which 152 outreaches had case files generated. 78 individuals were helped off of the streets and guided into rehabilitation facilities, taken in by family, or placed in temporary housing. Since SWAG began their efforts only in June of 2019, they have already helped 39 members of the homeless community get off of the streets. In conjunction with HOT, that totals 117 exits that were facilitated. As well, the Responsible Compassion Campaign aims to improve the quality of life for all citizens of Temecula by increasing, I quote, awareness, understanding, and participation in a comprehensive strategy in order to address homelessness in Temecula. The Community Services Department believes that in conjunction with the efforts of the Responsible Compassion Campaign, additional policy focusing on providing help to those struggling with addiction and substance abuse will be successful in improving quality of life for the citizens of Temecula, including those that are experiencing homelessness. Addiction and substance abuse are both focuses of this department because of the fact that they are some of the root causes that may lead a person towards experiencing homelessness. An addiction can create a hardship on finances as the individual prioritizes their addiction over their job and money management. This can lead to the loss of a job and of a house and in many cases will force an individual to turn to the streets. However, as drugs remain unfortunately common in local schools, this process is beginning far too early. This is why intervention when it comes to addiction is so important. We want to stop the process in its tracks. To discuss the Community Services Department's recommended policy, I would like to turn the floor over to my Community Services Superintendent, Bryce Albert. Mayor, City Council. Um, as previously stated by Director Cayley, it's important to attack homelessness at the prevention and diversion level. Every day we see people, and regardless of how successful each of these people seem to be, they are all at risk of beginning a downhill fight. The, that fight is the fight of addiction. Whether they start taking drugs to stay up later to get those finance reports done, or they begin to de-stress by smoking cannabis. The policy we are, uh, the policy we are uh, recommending is incentive to local businesses. To gain this, local businesses will need to introduce a minimum of three annual development slash training courses, similar to the ethics training required for the city uh, employees every two years. This uh, training will focus on addiction and substance abuse. These courses must reach at least 80% of the employees and be at least two hours in length each, totaling to six hours. The exact incentive will be determined by the city council, but it could be the waiving a of a business license fee redu or reducing transient occupancy tax for hotels but it will be, need to be enough to incentivize these businesses. If this is adopted, we do predict to see a loss of city funds. However, we anticipate to see the potential, uh, the potential recovery of these costs because the police department will, be, uh, will have reduced calls for service related to drug abuse and associated crimes. There will be a decrease in expenses for the fire department due to fewer emergency calls for overdoses and other emergencies related to drug abuse, a decrease in expenses for public works for less damage, cleanup of camps and needles and other drug-related messes, and a potential reduce in litigation costs associated with the city attorney. The proposed program will reduce the risk of homelessness by informing those that have yet to face a barrier on the damages of substance abuse or ones that are beginning to. Everyone has priorities, but as pro people begin to abuse drugs, those priorities change to those drugs, eventually driving them to the streets. This informative training will provide avenues to seek assistance, information about the dangers of substance abuse, and what to do if you see anybody abusing drugs. The training aims to divert those going down the path of substance abuse and addiction, therefore reducing homelessness that is caused by those circumstances. Another, uh, pro another proposal is there will be a uh, small grant to up to f five TVUSD sites hosting a similar training for uh, employees, uh, students, and other families and members of the public. And finally, we are proposing a budget increase of 150000 to management for prevention and diversion activities that will be later discussed by the finance director. This concludes our proportion of the presentation. We are open to questions now or at the end of the meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We are going to, does any of my colleagues have any questions? Yes. 
So I do have one question about the professional and development training. So I understand that you guys are trying to target like before substance abuse happens, but will this training also give um, suggestions or how maybe family members or friends can responsibly interact with those who already are suffering with substance abuse issues? Um, yes, the goal of the training overall is, to, um, is about all drug abuse, so whether you preventing it or if you do know somebody that is abusing drugs and how to uh, interact with them and how to try and push them in the right direction. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, you mentioned a $150,000 budget increase. Do you have the current budget for your department right now? Um, right now it is 100000 with a reimbursement of 50000 uh, every financial year from the cleanup of camps from the, the, the water something. I don't, I don't know, 100%. Thank you. Okay, any other questions before I move on? Okay, uh, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next city council report. I'm sorry? Right. Uh, Chief of Police, can we start with your city council report? Thank you. So in itself, homelessness is not a crime and by providing necessary resources and combining the use of outreach and enforcement together, it's critical to existing those assisting those experiencing homelessness within Temecula. Historically, law enforcement's role was that of only enforcement, but now it's shifted to a different approach, partnering with local city staff, nonprofits, and county partners by trying to outreach to these homeless. And by doing that, we're offering resources such as housing or rehab or help to get a home by contacting family members, even in other states. And when they can get this help, they usually don't want it because what comes with this help that is being offered also comes with rules. So maybe it's not able to, they're not able to use drugs if they live in this specific house, so they don't want it because we can't force them to take it. The only thing we can force is if they are committing a crime, and some of the crimes that these homeless people would commit usually would be drugs, trespassing, public indecency, or a danger to themselves or others. And overall, the outreach and enforcement together is what we're doing. And our general policy focuses on um, a, a multidisciplinary group, which uh, my police lieutenant, Molly, will go into more detail on right now. Good morning, council. So as Chief of Police said, right now we're currently using outreach um, and enforcement to help with the homeless issue. And like she said, homelessness is not a crime. Um, but with the balance of outreach and enforcement, homeless population has actually decreased in Temecula. Um, so our general direction would be, like she said, a multidisciplinary team. Um, getting the help not just off the streets. We want to help the homeless become um, productive members of society. So we cannot fix the issue with just one solution. Um, every homeless person is different in why they're in their position, whether that's substance abuse, mental health issues, physical health, or they can't afford housing or they don't have any financial support. So our multidisciplinary team would consist of a deputy, a community service officer, nurse, doctor, clinician, a city social worker, and a city employee. Their purpose would be to go out and firsthand help homeless directly to find what they need, whether that be rehab, a home, or a mental health facility. The team would be well-rounded, representing every resource that they could get. It's not just law enforcement. Um, and the multidisciplinary team would not only get them off the streets, but guide them towards a life as a productive citizen. And we have confirmed with the financial team um, where these funds are coming from. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions that my colleagues have regarding this report? Yes. Just one quick question. Would this multi multidisciplinary team move with the police force when they interact with homeless people, or they would, be, would they be based somewhere else? So yeah, they would move and go out. Since we currently only have 35 homeless people in Temecula, um, they would move out as a team going together, representing the city, mm -hmm. representing um, hospitals and help. Um, but yeah, they would go out and help them firsthand. All right, thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay, any other questions? Yes. 
just to clarify, um, the education and informational, I guess, proposition that you are guys, is that is strictly for homeless or is that for general population as well? Say that again? So for your team that you're, your the intent- The multidisciplinary team. Yes, it is, uh, you said that your intent is to inform and educate. Is that just strictly for the homeless population or will that also, I guess, trickle down to uh, everyday citizens? I wouldn't say that it would be to directly inform and educate. I think our multidisciplinary team main goal is to represent those resources that they can get, mainly for the homeless because um, just law enforcement can only do so much because being homeless isn't a crime. So that team would represent like mental health facilities, stuff like that. So I don't know directly if it would educate and inform, but get them to the resources that they need to become productive members of society. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yes, go ahead. I would just like to ask, um, in the situation that a homeless person does not want to leave the streets, even though you reach out to him, what would you do? <laughs> um, so I personally am not um, a, you know, a clinician or someone that does know, like a social worker that does know the resources that they can have. Um, but I think out of all the solutions that we do like have presented, like affordable housing and stuff, this is directly going to them and helping them. Um, whether they want the help or not, we're getting as close to them as we can to give them the resources that they need. So, yeah. Do I have a, one more question, I'm sorry. Um, does your multidisciplinary team consist of a substance abuse specialist as well? Um, that would most likely be either our social worker or the clinician to help with them, and then that would lead them to get to a mental health facility or a rehab center. Okay, yeah. all right, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? No? All right, we're gonna go ahead and move on to Chief of, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chief of Fire, please, and uh, go ahead and give your staff report. Good morning, Mayor, good morning, Council. The Fire Department has, is, has identified three core problematic areas relating to homeless encampment, the first of which is open fire risk. The risk of open fires is exacerbated by um, the use of open fires for warmth and cooking by homeless populations in homeless encampments, especially in areas of high fire risk, such as riverbeds, where there is a large amount of dry vegetation and uh, which causes a possible fire risk in that regard. Our solution to this issue is to provide not only an information campaign to those homeless populations in those high-risk areas to safely manage the open fires that they do use for their daily survival and necessity, um, but also further education campaigns um, with the homeless so that instead of being cited for um, illegal fires and illegal open fires, because these are not inherently illegal or a crime, uh, we should continue not only uh, campaigns using pamphlets, but also outreach um, with cooperation from the HOT team and the police department in order to properly educate these individuals on the use of safe open fires without any endangerment to their well-being. Furthermore, um, we could also use non-essential personnel um, and auxiliary personnel in order to perform outreach with these individuals um, to reduce the use of emergency services, which are a large expense for the fire department, while still maintaining decent rapport with these homeless populations. Because the major issue is the lack of contact um, that our services have with these homeless individuals. And the first step that we could take is an information campaign. The fire department has already um, established a campaign of sorts using uh, pamphlets on safe fire use, but in order to account for possible illiteracy amongst the homeless population, we can also use um, our personnel to establish contact with them and essentially spread the word amongst these encampments in order to encourage uh, the positive and safe use of these open fires. The second primary issue is with public health and safety as a result of contracted illness or contamination and biohazard from the use of drugs via intravenous methods. Um, so the, uh, 
the deposition of needles and other materials used by some homeless populations in the use of drugs does pose a public health and safety risk, especially in areas near encampments. In order to account for this, um, we will encourage the use of uh, the public in order to receive non-essential, non-emergency calls uh, through the non-emergency uh, non phone line in order to properly deal with and um, uh, using these preventative measures in order to deal with these biohazard risks without the cost of our emergency uh, personnel, um, as this can cost upwards of $4,000 per response call. Furthermore, uh, a, another issue under public health and safety is the overuse of our emergency uh, phone lines and emergency response uh, by the public in response to um, an, any homeless encounter. 80% uh, of calls regarding medical issues amongst the homeless are made by the general public, and in many of these cases, uh, the emergency response is not necessitated as there is no emergency present. In order to mitigate these uh, cost factors, a public service announcement using uh, media options uh, through the uh, IT department uh, can be utilized, such as social media or the Temecula uh, phone application in order to make it aware to the general public on proper procedure for establishing an, emerg an emergency phone call and to reduce the amount of wasteful emergency phone calls in general. The third issue is establishing proper medical services and evacuation to homeless personnel. This again originates from a lack of contact as, um, as the police department has stated. Um, there is an unwillingness for contact and assistance uh, by much of the homeless population and furthermore, establishing contact in general can be an arduous task. Um, in cases of dangerous or extreme weather or a nearby fire, which can pose a health risk to these homeless populations, uh, the fire department is recommending um, a use of the uh, technology and resources made available by the IT department, as well as using um, most likely on a bi-monthly basis, although this can be changed on a bi-monthly basis, um, establishing regular contact with homeless encampments and communities uh, in order to make them aware of uh, inclement weather uh, conditions which can endanger them. There are resources available such as uh, warming or cooling stations throughout the city for uh, individuals to use, uh, such as the homeless, to make them aware of these resources non-essential personnel can be used to establish contact with them on a regular basis and to make sure that to the uh, health and well-being of these homeless communities is ensured. Uh, furthermore, a major issue on, uh, regarding medical services is the abuse of medical services by some homeless populations who may be addicted to drugs. They will often, um, they will often uh, pose an illness or injury in order to gain access to a hospital where they uh, can receive pain medications which will mitigate their withdrawals. The lack of communication between hospitals, the fire department and the police department in this regard um, results in the continued abuse of these uh, systems made available. Uh, in order to mitigate this, we should encourage increased communication with existing uh, resources, such as um, an application which is uh, being um, released at the moment, wherein uh, these individuals can be tracked and uh, made sure that they do not receive these uh, expensive treatments to uh, to substitute their addiction, and instead can receive proper treatment and rehabilitation. Uh, these are the three main concerns that we uh, have and our proposed solutions to each. Um, we are now open to questioning now or at the end of the meeting. Any questions from my colleagues? Okay, so I have a question. Uh, you said that there is an unwillingness to establish contact by homeless communities where perhaps there are drug-related issues. 
Um, why do you think there is an unwillingness from the homeless communities on why they're not contacting authorities or contacting medical personnel to come help with the situation? While I am not uh, qualified to state the, re the underlying reasons why, um, mm -hmm. I do know that a large portion or a decent portion of the homeless community um, simply just does not want help and um, is not willing to seek that help and is, um, they're not willing to accept it. I'm not qualified to state why, um, as that's not in my um, purview, really. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Um, to go off what Mayor Ziani just said, um, what if they do not want to um, comply with the enforced policy that you have come up with in this, um, in the event that a homeless person does not want to comply and go further with that? As stated before, um, that Mayor Ziani said that they don't feel, uh, they may not feel comfortable outreaching help from the authorities. In the event that they don't comply, what would be the solution to that? Our initiatives are completely voluntary and are simply meant to extend the resources available to them if they wish. Uh, the lack of contact in general uh, throughout homeless communities remains a problem as a result of their geographic situation where they're, uh, where they're settled and inhabited in areas that are hard to access um, as well as uh, their lack of ability to stay connected. Um, this is completely voluntary. Uh, we are not forcing any individual to seek help or to be a part of this initiative. Uh, the main solution is to extend our contact so that it is available to them if they so wish. Um, this mainly comes in the format of our early weather warning systems as well as establishing proper uh, fire safety um, when in the use of open fires these are not inherently, it's not inherently illegal at all to, um, to go against our initiatives at all. It's just a means to be able to provide that assistance uh, towards homeless communities so that they can stay safe and maintain a high standard of well-being. Okay. Anybody, any other, any other questions? Okay, all right, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next council report, and it is by the Public Works. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, today our department is going to discuss our policy around homeless camp cleanups. And to give you guys some background on that before we go into our proposal, I'm going to bring up Alex, our civil engineer. Uh, thank you, Council. Uh, so the past calendar year expenditure upon Homeless camp cleanups was around $100,000 for contact, contract services. These expenditures have allowed approximately 50 camps to be removed. Of course, they are given prior notice before we are uh, going in for the cleanup, and they also have time to pick up any valuables that they have that we gather. Uh, all this work is being done by contract services and the city staff. Cleanups along the creeks are within the jurisdiction of the Riverside County Flood Control, with Re Riverside reimbursing $50,000 in cleanups per year for their, our current agreement. While the amount of waste cleared from each site varies, larger cleanups see multiple 40-yard dumpsters filled. Furthermore, many of the cleanups include the handling of biohazard debris, which includes needles and human feces, etc resulting in extensive wariness of crews to their surroundings in order to avoid accidents and injuries. Now I'm going to hand it back to Ryan. Thank you. The Public Works Department is requesting an additional funding increase to $150,000 per fiscal year for our camp cleanups, 75,000 of which will be reimbursed by our agreement with Riverside County Flood Control. The other $75,000 will be spent by the city. Um, our current policy is that we have $50,000 per fiscal year to spend. We are um, requesting an additional $25,000, which we have discussed with the financial director. Um, that is the extent of our proposal, and I am open for questions before we move on. Thank you. Any questions before we move on? All right, we're good to move on. Go ahead. 
Thank you. I'll hand it off to the uh, next staff member. The development. Thank you. So before I begin our proposal, I'd like to invite my colleague Zach Danbury to go ahead and initiate our background and proposal. Good morning, Mayor, Council, and all those attending. Um, there are many different reasons why um, homelessness occurs, but we have focused on the socioeconomic reasons, such as the high cost of living and the raising house, pricing, and house prices and rent in California especially. Um, in 2015, we tried attempting to solve this problem by proposing um, the leftovers of a tax that was uh, $12.5 million for the creation of affordable housing. And then the um, Housing Services Ad Hoc um, Subcommittee directed staff to um, create requests for proposals or RFPs to sol solicitate um, pr proposals from interested developers for the construction of affordable housing developments. But then in 2017, the City Council um, could find no projects that would fit the requirements that the proposals announced, so then they denied it. But those, that $12.5 million still existed and is still for our use today. Our proposal is that we um, introduce the RFPs again in order to find a better suited um, developer in order to uh, build affordable housing to provide relief for the people who are not living up to the economic opportunities that they can with living with lower wages. And then also for the people that were previously homeless that are coming back in order to start a new life, to have a lower rent in order to um, provide a more accurate or better transition from the homelessness to a new life once they recover. And that's it. And I'd like to give it to Christian Bowen to finish. So many of you may ask, what would make one eligible for this program? Well, the California Senate Bill 341 requires that the affordable housing to support the individuals would have to earn no more than 80% of the area's median income, and the city could fund these housing developments, which would, be, which would specifically support those experiencing homelessness and can also prevent the situation from happening in the first place by having an alternative to go opposed to the streets. Does anyone have any questions? Council members, do you have any questions? Um, I do have one. So I, so you mentioned that this housing would be for both those who are homeless and those that are at risk for homelessness, correct? So this would be more of an initiative to prevent homelessness mm -hmm. um, in, in, in an instance where the housing costs are already high and the employment is not permitting the resident to continue living there. This would be more of an alternative opposed to going directly to the streets, thus preventing um, a larger homelessness crisis. And would there be any rules or anything set in place for those who do live there? Like, are there any regulations that they must maintain? Um, so far, we have not initiated any rules or regulations. This is going to be more of a group family um, apartment style living where there would be more, there would be more or less, since they would be still contributing mm -hmm. to the affordable housing. Um, there would be less of a, a rules and implications in doing so. Thank you. Any other questions regarding this council report? Yes, go ahead. So just to clarify, it is available to people who are, are already homeless? Um, this is more of an initiative to target the residents that could potentially be on the street. Um, for those that are Currently, in our streets of Temecula, this is not directly directed towards them. So could they get to this affordable housing if they already were homeless or no? So they would have to be earning a certain income um, to be able to afford the, the housing. The, the, the costs have not been directly set up um, so far, um, but that is to be discussed in further matters. I can actually add on to that. So the way that the affordable housing works is yet to make below 80% um, of the average medium income for the Riverside County. So for example, if the medium income was 62,000, then it would be those making below 24,000, I mean 24, yeah, 24, a year that would be able to live in that house. So it could be either those, like we said, to prevent people that are at risk from being overburdened by the heavy and rising rent, I mean, rent rates in California, and also be those 
that do not make that amount that are coming back from homelessness or, yeah. So it's more of a prevention and, prevention and relief of those that are at risk or were at risk. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Congressman. Um, would they, so they would still have to pay a percentage of like the rent per se? Yes, it's capped. And so therefore it doesn't continue rising like we'd see in other buildings. Okay, That's the point of affordable housing. Thank you. Okay, any other questions regarding this council report? Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna go ahead and move to information technology. Uh, please provide your council report. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so starting off, I would like to talk about the, the, yeah, the challenges we have between the communication between the homeless and the departments that would be, uh, not only the departments, but the people that would be working hands-on with, the, uh, with these individuals. So how information technology would like to um, fix, oh, wait, no, 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 the issue at hand is that, um, yeah, that the, these departments don't have any way to communicate or to properly manage um, the profiles of these in individuals they have. Um, so they need a place to gather names, where they mainly locate, where, um, and some personal information if legal uh, allows. And to talk about some of the um, programs we already have out there to, um, for these homeless to, um, for our outreach would be my, uh, the if Information Technology Assistant Director, Rebecca Salazar. So the first prong of our proposed solution um, is the utilization of existing solutions, um, which I'm going to go through. The first of these is public service announcements, um, which are to be used effective, to effectively communicate information about how to interact with the homeless population to the general populace um, to improve our communication with the citizens. The second is the City of Temecula application, which allows citizens to be able to report homelessness to the city in a direct and efficient way and to the correct departments. Uh, the third is the city website, which has more information about how to interact with the homeless population and how to contact the appropriate departments, as well as information about what the city has already accomplished in regards to the problem of homelessness, um, uh, our mission statements, and more information. The next is the point-in-time count, count application, um, which is used every year for the annual canvassing of the homeless population during a set period of time to try and expand our mapping and connect more people to the resources they need. The next is the homeless encampment application, which is used to record encampments that may need to be dealt with in collaboration with the county um, or other areas of jurisdiction. Um, and uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, the next is the use of security surveillance, such as cameras at the entrance, entrances of public bathrooms um, or other public um, areas in order for the police department to be able to enforce law violations and perform um, virtual rounds. So back onto, um, we have one proposed idea and it's called the uh, mapping application, it, uh, which will be a series of e ESR, ESRIs, GIS based maps, surveys, dashboards, and dashboards which will summarize data collected and present in an effective interface. This will allow for the sharing of the data and functionality between various publics and private, private agency, uh, such as um, Temecula Police Department and City of Temecula Responsible Campaign Program at different levels of access and will allow for the capturing and storing of the location and interactions and the survey data and the um, images of the Im individuals. So what's different between the um, the mapping application and the point by point um, map is that the um, the homeless mapping application is an ongoing um, ongoing program where the, we will have um, officers out collecting and doing these surveys, are um, asking the home, the individuals to do these surveys so we can have a no by no basis with these homeless individuals while the um, point by point in time mapping is on X amount, on X days, the, um, people will go out and do surveys, so you only have a, a limited view of the, um, the homeless, while the proposed idea is a more accurate and more um, in time 
basis of the homeless. And so the fiscal impact of our uh, the proposed idea will cost $71,000 initially, but um, there, but as the years go on, the annual cost for it will be 31,000. And where we will get this budget is from the operating, operating budget that is already in hand. And if, and we are now open for questions. I have a quick question. <clears throat> so you talked about the point, in, the point in time count and uh, police searches and uh, going into perhaps homeless encampments and finding out who is homeless and why they are there. What if, well, in order to get that information and report it to our local government, what if uh, homeless individuals do not want to interact with the police? So how the point in time program kind of works is it's not only just police officers, but it's also um, some private organization that are working with the homeless. So some of these people are at a no to no basis with these people. So they're more likely to answer these surveys than um, reluctantly. And some of the police officers that do uh, administer these surveys will sometimes use some uh, force like um, like said, stated before, it's not illegal to be homeless, mm -hmm. but they are breaking some laws. Like um, uh, uh, one of them is like um, using uh, the bathroom outside. That's like illegal. So what the police can do is be, is say, hey, it's either you're gonna face some jail time or or get a fine or take this survey. And more likely than not, they'll just take the survey instead of facing their fine or jail time. So using a public restroom and loitering oh. would be considered illegal? No, I didn't mean like a public restroom. I mean like using the restrooms, like not outside, like kind of going on the, like the, the side of the street like that. I didn't okay, mean like so public, public restroom. Okay, so public urination? Yes, like that. Okay, so, okay, got it. Um, but my question is basically for both of you, if, if it is a homeless encampment or they are by themselves with a few, group of, with a few groups of people not causing any harm, and they do not want to engage with the police or engage with uh, volunteers that are a part of the point in time count, are the police or the uh, point in time count people going to record those individuals as homeless even if they don't want to engage? So the homeless population has the option of whether or not they want to volunteer their information, okay. um, which they um, will be communicated to them is for their own benefit and in case, um, because they tend to move around from location to location if they want to access resources um, at any point in time. Um, however, from the information technology department, what we have is the tool um, to be able to efficiently communicate with them um, and to be able to efficiently communicate um, in between departments, such as in between uh, public agencies and private agencies, the information that would be needed to try and um, expand the resources that are available to the, homelessness po the homeless population. Um, but if they were unwilling to comply with um, uh, survey takers or police officers, um, it's not illegal and we uh, would not try to enforce it. Okay, thank you very much. Does any, yes. Go ahead, Congressman. Keep calling you Congressman. Yeah. Council member. So your proposed Temecula, uh, City of Temecula application, is this in a way to help mitigate the co possible costs and expenditures by fire and other law enforcement agencies where, I guess, reports of homelessness would have otherwise been reported as emergencies when they're necessarily not? Yes, so the City of Temecula application is currently available and um, there is an option within the application for citizens to be able to report um, different situations such as potholes in public um, and one of those options is homeless encampments um, or individuals who are homeless that um, they feel the um, city needs to be aware of. Okay, thank you. Yes. I, just, I do have one question going off of what Mayor Ziani said. Will we run into any ethical or even like legal dilemmas of having citizens kind of s surveil and like pay attention to all of the homeless people and like always watching over them? Like, is this like a broader ethical issue as well of like having data on people who necessarily don't want to be tracked? With respect, that's not really our area of expertise. And if it's um, unethical or illegal, then it wouldn't be um, implemented. Um, but this is the tool that we have available in order to try and achieve our goals. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yes, go ahead. So as a way to better connect and in, 
inform the citizens about this homelessness issue, would you be able to use Instagram and Facebook to connect with them? We do have social media accounts from the city of Temecula, which um, we can put public service announcements on um, or more information that is also accessible on our website or on our apps. All right, thank you. Any other questions? No? All right. <clears throat> we are going to go ahead and move on to finance. Please provide your council report. Um, good morning, council. Good morning, mayor. So I will be going over the fiscal impact of all of the recommendations provided by the various departments. So starting off for the affordable housing, the city has a total, um, like stated before, a total of $12.5 million available within the affordable housing fund. And um, this will be appropriated at a future, future council meeting when selecting the winning um, or appropriate developer team that they feel is necessary to build those um, houses. Um, moving on to technology, um, the recommended solution to increase the surveillance and providing a homeless interactions map will have a one-time expenditure for $10,000 for iPads and $25,000 for surveillance viewing workstations. And um, aside from this, it will have ongoing expenditures of $25,000 annually for a cloud subscription to ESRI, um, $6,000 annually for cellular, cellular data for the iPads, and $5,000 annually for um, surveillance equipment licensing. And both of these um, one-time and ongoing appropriations will be um, recommended to be funded by Measure S. And um, before I move on to community service, I know the director of community service would like to add something regarding the um, finances. I would like to make a clarification on the information that my superintendent provided a minute ago. Um, the current cleanup budget is actually $100,000. The responsible compassion budget is eight hundred. Four, sorry, $400,000, and the overall budget of my department is $20 million. The proposed budget increase would be for prevention and intervention strategies. It would not be for the cleanup budget. Thank you. Um, so going off of that, yes, the recommendation to contract for um, additional services to provide the prevention and diversion case management is projected to be um, $150,000 annually. And again, this is recommended to be funded by Measure S. Um, moving on to public, public works, the recommendation to increase the reimbursement for homeless encampment cleanups to uh, $50,000 would generate re revenue to offset the cost of these services. So this revenue would be um, deposited into the city's general fund. Um, I would like to touch upon the fire department as well since they are just um, extending their contact and improving the communication within um, the homeless community. Um, they just want to optimize the use of funds in the most effective way possible, but in the event that the fire department and um, the fire um, chief would like to um, appro appropriate more funds, I would have a discussion with them about that. And lastly, for the police department, their recommendation for a multidisciplinary team. Um, so the one community service officer would be an annual cost of 100 $33,000, as well as the one code enforcement officer at an annual cost of $124,000, both being funded by Measure S. And the other members of that team, which would be the doctor, the nurse, the clinician, and the social worker, um, as proposed, um, this would be, the prices would be determined upon um, conclusion of the RFP process when they feel they have found an appropriate members for that team. So it depends on who they would like to contract for that. And um, yeah, so we are open to questions regarding those funds. Any questions regarding those funds? Yes, go ahead. Um, the Director of Finance uh, has stated that there would be no changes to the Fire Department's budget. Would the um, Director of Finance like to confirm that there would be no changes to that and that our efforts are simply using the resources currently available to us and the budget currently available to us with no changes uh, thereof? Yes, I would like, I would confirm that. Okay, any other questions? 
Okay, well that actually concludes our council business agenda item. Uh, we are now going to move on to uh, city council opinions. Um, so we are gonna go ahead and start with public comments, excuse me, yes. Uh, we are gonna go ahead and move on to public comments and then um, provide uh, city council opinions. So Madam City Clerk, can you uh, let us know how many public comments we have today? Yes, Madam Mayor, we have three public comments okay. on the agenda item. Um, first, we have Tiffany from Concerned Shoppers of Temecula followed by Donald's T. Okay, can you go ahead and bring up the first one? Oh, she's already here. Oh my God, hi. Can I get my picture up there, please? Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> we do not have a homeless problem in Temecula. We're Temecula. We have amazing wineries. We have hip breweries. We have beautiful parks, but most importantly, we have beautiful people but we don't have homeless people, ew. I have noticed an increase in the number of campgrounds in our beautiful riverbeds and the RV parks that we've established too in the Walmart and Stater Brother shopping centers. Um, so that's awful nice of Temecula to improve that. Um, but homeless people, no, we don't do that. I just don't see it. Can you guys please um, talk about a problem uh, that uh, exists and that we need to move on to more important business? Like bringing in higher end shopping to our community. I am sick and tired of driving to the OC or to San Diego in order to shop. All I'm asking for is maybe a little Bloomies, Prada, Maybe a Tiffany's, maybe. Is that so much to ask? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can we go ahead and have our second speaker, please? Yes, Madam Mayor. In addition, we have two more public comments from the original three. Um, up next, we have... Oh, my bad. My bad, I got these mixed up. Up next, we have uh, Sally Manella, uh, followed by Brandon. <coughs> All right. Can we go ahead and have Sally? My name is Sally Manella, and I usually sound a little bit better than this, but I'm not sure what's wrong today. Anyway, I want you to know that I provide meals to the homeless. I prepare. <coughs> <coughs> I prepare them in my home, which is spotlessly clean and sanitary, <coughs> and I serve it in the public parks. <coughs> so I want you to know that what you're doing is prohibiting me from making a living. Oh, I do charge for the <coughs> I do charge for these meals, by the way, so <coughs> oh, that's not good. <coughs> anyway, I want you to know that these homeless deserve to have the food that I'm preparing <coughs> every day in my spotlessly clean <laughs> kitchen. Um, I don't see anything wrong with it. Oh, And I think I need to be able to continue to do that for these, <coughs> these homeless people. Thank you. For <coughs> Thank you so much, Sally. We hope you feel better. Um, <laughs> all right, we're going to go ahead and move on to our third public speaker. And Madam City Clerk, who is that again? Our third public speaker is Brandon, followed by Donald T. All right, Brandon.
Good evening, City Council, Mayor. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this topic because it's something that is true and dear to my heart. We continue to have homeless people in our community and they need the resources that were discussed today, but what I'd like to ask is what are you gonna do? Are you gonna volunteer in our community? There's opportunities to get out there and volunteer for homeless encampment cleanups. I haven't seen any of you at those meetings. So let's, let's get you out there and, and all the staff, you should be out there too. You should be at these homeless encampment cleanups. Are you helping maybe at the food pantry? Are you getting involved or engaging on this very serious topic that impacts all of you? You should be the leaders in the community. You're the future leaders as well. So how are you gonna address this issue? How are you gonna volunteer your time? Yeah, there's a lot of great shows on Netflix, but what are you gonna do to get out there and address this issue that's real today? I want you to think about that. I know you can do it. You're the future and you're gonna do great things, but let's address this issue now and get out in the community and help. Thank you very much. All right, any more public comments? Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, up next is John T, and then uh, followed by IB Wealthy. Thank you. Hello. So I came here last year, which is funny because I don't recognize any of you guys. And elections are like every four years, and it's this year, and uh, I don't know what happened. That's kind of crazy. So bringing you back to last year when I came, we were talking about short-term rentals. And uh, I, I debuted my beautiful new short-term rental, La Croix Chapeau. It's a two-bedroom, uh, or three-bedroom, two-bath, 2,000-square-foot 2, home. It sleeps like 40. Um, and there was parking, you know, pretty much anywhere in the neighborhood. It was great. Uh, it was highly successful. Now it's illegal all of a sudden. I don't know why. Um, so apparently like 90% of my residents came and complained about me, uh, which is a real bummer because like, hey, I think I was doing a pretty good job. I was making a lot of money. Um, one thing I was thinking is like, hmm, how do I give back to the city who gave me, you know, just so much money over the last year? And how do I piss my neighbors off? And I came up with something. Free housing for homeless at my La Crash a Pa. Sleeps about 40, you know, it has a, a pool and a game room. They can stay for free, so I'm not charging anybody. They can stay as long as they want, it's not short term. Um, you know, I've made my money, now it's time for uh, the neighborhood to enjoy the spoils. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we have another public comment, correct? Yes, this is our final comment, and it's from IB Wealthy, representing the business community. All right, thank you. Madam Mayor, City Council, staff, I own a business here in Temecula, and I have to deal with these homeless people constantly. And they're stealing stuff out of my business, they're ruining my customer service experience, and I need to know what you guys are doing about it because it's only getting worse. And I, you know, I provide tax dollars for you guys. I mean, without my tax dollars, this doesn't happen. So you need to actually come to my aid and do something for me, you know, so you're, you're talking about spending all this money on these homeless people, and it's my money. So I want to know what you guys are going to do to give me some money back or to, to deal with the, all the issues I have to deal with as a business person. Come on, tell me right now. You can't tell me right now? See, this is what I'm talking about, city government. All right. Well, I'm watching you all, and I got money that I'm going to throw at the next candidate who's going to tell me what I want to hear. Okay? All right, bye. Thank you so much. Um, and that was our last public comment, correct? Yes, Madam Mayor, no further comments. All right, thank you. And thank you all who uh, shared their thoughts with us uh, this morning. We are now going to move on. Uh, tr truly now to uh, uh, city council opinion. So do any of us want to start? I think we're going to go ahead and start with 
Council Member Henderson with your opinion on how we should act currently right now uh, after we have heard all of these enlightening voices. Well, I think an idea I propose is going alongside the community service, how they have, they're sending out grants to TVUSD for informational meetings about um, this homeless problem. I believe that the kids should be informed about this homeless problem. And maybe by informing the kids, we can push them, or not really push them, but like maybe we can encourage them to go out and volunteer at these homeless outreach programs we have, such as Project Touch or any other programs that are out there. And in doing so, it'll inform the kids, which the kids will go home and tell their parents, and the parents will be informed about the homeless issue. And it'll help increase the self-worth of the homelessness because they're seeing kids are being involved, so why can't they? All right, thank you. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and turn it to Council Member Duran. All right, so also going off what Council Member Henderson said, I also believe that we should strongly implement education, but not only for the homelessness, as a lot of programs have talked about, educating them of the resources that are available to them and outreach, but a lot of education focusing on the community. I know we put out a lot of PSAs and things like that on social media, but what if we truly give them a stake in this? What if we create more buy-in? We create a workshop that they can come to and truly understand the entire process of what we do and how they themselves can volunteer. Because we have a community that's really heavily focused on volunteering. They're very generous. But right now their generosity is strong is usually in the form of money or food, which is great, but if we can inform them on better and more responsible ways to volunteer and help out with the homelessness community. I feel like that would be a really great thing that we could do. And also reach out to the high schools because I know a lot of high school stu students would love to be involved in volunteer organizations that are focusing on this and we can create a lot of buy-in from them as well. Okay. Uh, yes, Con Council Member Rodriguez. Um, with respect to the other council members and um, their view and opinion on this, I do agree with what Council Member Henderson said in accordance to um, the TVUSD district being involved within this issue and how the community services has approached this. And uh, further that, um, although one of the main causes of, um, homeless, of homelessness and leading up to that is the substance abuse and the addiction, uh, we also have to take a look at the other things and other causes behind that, such as poverty. For instance, if we have a child who is growing up and over the course of high school, they are living in circumstances where their budget, um, where their family budget and expenses and it is just overall low and they're in a state of poverty. Um, I do agree with the idea um, brought up with the housing, with the affordable housing. However, in addition to that, within educational programs, I think that education as a whole needs to be involved in educating um, our children and those within the high school who are preparing for what lies beyond high school and for when they graduate, um, the options going into that because college is not for everyone. Um, there are multiple programs out there in which we can involve our career technical education pathways, such as CTE, um, other, otherwise known as CTE, um, to help in accordance and um, raise more awareness for the options beyond high school, in addition to the education on the effects of drugs and substance abuse to overall prevent that. Yeah, I, I agree with the vast majority of what you have just said, but we're gonna go ahead and allow council member uh, Schmidt to give his opinion as well. To kind of build on what Council Member Rodriguez was saying, um, there are a lot of different causes of homelessness. We talked about a couple, but you look at your drug abuse, you look at your um, monetary, I guess, I guess, um, well, monetary problems, um, poverty, mental health. And one of the ideas that I actually really liked was coming from the community services. They proposed this solution through um, different businesses and schools where there's this incentive to provide these trainings. I like that idea, I don't think it goes far enough because it's only tackling one issue on that and that's the drug abuse. If you were to implement a similar system that tackles different um, economic literacy and mental health and kind of address all of these different situations, we stop that flow of 
homelessness from these different areas that would cause it to become chronic. And if we were to um, implement a system similar to, um, similar to what uh, community services has, but on that wider spectrum of areas and bring in different groups of nonprofits and um, volunteer agencies, I believe that we could really stop the majority of homelessness at the source without having to kind of mitigate and stop the bleeding with the homeless that we already have. All right, thank you. Does anybody else want to provide their opinion about homelessness before we move on? Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> and another point to make, and we, I agree full-heartedly on a lot of our efforts to stop homelessness at the source, but another thing that we have to address is the issue of chronic homelessness. Now, there are a lot of cities across the United States who have implemented maybe what some might say a non-traditional approach to address chronic homelessness, and that is the housing first standpoint. So rather than giving homeless people resources to go into housing if they're clean, if they agree to get a job, and all of these things that I agree are incredibly important in helping them reintegrate back into society, they approach it from the back end and they say, what if we give these people housing first and then we make those resources available to them while they're in the house? And slowly what a lot of studies have shown is that they will take up these resources. And rather than being in encampments as we have seen from the fire chief and other areas that have said, cause hazards such as fires, there's public health hazards, they cost a lot of money to clean up. And the process of taking people to and from jail also costs us a lot of money. So all of these things that we're mitigating in the process of having all of these encampments could potentially be stopped if we provided housing first and we'd allowed these people to come, live, get in the mindset that they need to be to then reach out and try to adopt resources and better themselves and get a job. That would be, you can't necessarily assume that someone who's homeless and has substance abuse problems issues, has mental health problems, is going to want to just better themselves because the resource is there. They know of these resources, and we know that it doesn't work to just, just tell them what, where they are because they don't really want to give up their ways right away. And we have to understand that this is like a mental thing. It's a block that they can't get over because of everything that they've gone through and all of the issues that they already have. So I feel like trying a new approach and to help with our chronic homeless issue, which we've said there's around 35. And so I think this would be a new way to maybe get that problem secured and handled. I can agree with that to an extent. However, are you proposing, as a question to your argument, are you proposing that we set up an actual homeless shelter? So that's definitely something that's crossed my mind, and that's what a lot of other cities have done when implementing this housing first strategy. But we've also seen that nonprofits are always very helpful in providing us with shelter. So many nonprofits, however, are geared towards giving people shelter after they've adopted programs. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that we really truly reach out to the community and we see what grants are out there and things, if and we reach out to our community members if we can create this shift in thinking that maybe we need to start it another way. And so maybe this money is going to come from the like city council and us saying that we need to build a homeless shelter, but I feel like there are other avenues we can go to first before we go straight to, well, we are the ones that have to make this homeless shelter. Okay, I can agree with you to an extent, but um, for Temecula to build a homeless shelter for 35 homeless people mm -hmm. would be an incredible amount of money that, to be honest, would be wasted. Because um, you talked about chronic homelessness. Mm -hmm. If someone is chronically homeless and does not want to change, why would they want to abandon their ways and go to a homeless shelter? Mm -hmm. And to be honest, there are only 30, 31, actually, I would say registered Temecula yes. homeless that have been around for a while. So in my opinion, it's more about strengthening the services we already have and being proactive about the problem that perhaps could proceed in future years if we are not proactive right now. So building a homeless shelter uh, would, in my opinion, be a waste of money that we could be using towards um, preventing homelessness, especially with youth. Throughout our nation, youth 
homelessness is increasing, not perhaps in Temecula, but around our state in Riverside County and throughout our nation as well, um, primarily uh, with couch surfing. When students are graduate from uh, high school, especially college, we have an over $1 trillion student loan debt crisis. So they, though, those are the, are, the, are the people that need help right now, the youth. And um, for the chronic homeless people who are already in our community right now, it's more about strengthening transportation and giving them every single option um, uh, to stop their ways, but it's also their own decision on whether they want to do it or not. With all due respect, oh, I, okay. do you like to? Um, just to uh, go back to what you were saying originally, um, I agree with Mayor Ziani and her um, viewpoint on the, the ideal that we need to strengthen what we already have, because in my opinion, if we are going to build a homeless shelter that is a waste of money in terms of the number of people that we have right now in Temecula who are homeless, and in addition to what you said earlier, um, we can't necessarily just say we're going to give you a home kind of thing and give them that action, because what our city staff has given us report-wise is also in accordance to the ideal of strengthening the systems that we have already and the outreach programs that there, there are multiple outreach programs out there that can help these people in the situation that they're in. And to give them, um, to put them in the position where, like you were saying, they have mental illnesses or they're um, addicted to uh, drugs or have substance abuse issues, um, in addition to what Mayor Ziani was saying, where it's majority um, the young, pop the population of young people who are homeless is on a rise. If we just hand them a house, um, what, and what you're saying is like, oh, well, later we can incorporate the idea of how about you go work now and things like that? What if they do not go in accordance with that? What do we do in that situation? Because in that situation, it is almost set up for failure in terms of we're just giving it to them. But while they have these issues still, they may not want to comply with the, um, with the agenda set up by, the, um, by giving them that home and by giving them just things like that. When in opposition to that, we do have programs and multiple programs that can easily be strengthened and put on outreach programs like our fire department and our police department talked about with the, um, with their stance on it. In addition to the information technology um, standpoint of it, where the app can help bring uh, more attention and outreach to that issue. Yes. Um. Yeah. Um, so I can absolutely understand all the viewpoints that I'm seeing, but with the last two ideas that have been brought up, it brings up a like interesting viewpoint. It's that idea of if we focus on what we are now. We're placing a higher moral value on people who may become homeless rather than people who are already homeless. You're putting one life that saying that this person's life weighs more than the other. So just to clarify the stance that uh, Council Member Duran came to, um, the idea behind the housing is we provide housing with no strings attached. You are allowed to come in there. What does that do? That takes rid of the camps. That way we go, we clean up the camps because people have moved into these houses. Camps are no longer a problem. We don't have to go in year after year and go necessarily clean up with that. While they're in these houses, they can go and it takes, it's going to take time, but they're still going to have that option of help and these resources. They're not forced on them for the housing that they're provided, but they have them around. Combine this with our community services idea of this education. We stop the flow of chronic um, of chronic homelessness. If we go and we address the issues of substance abuse, we address the issues of um, economic illiteracy, and we address all these different issues that lead to the chronic homelessness, we stop the issue, but we're also humanely taking care of the homeless that we already have. And we're addressing both sides of the problem. I would also like to add that I agree completely that we should strengthen the programs that we have. All of the recommendations that we heard today, I wholeheartedly agree with them, and I don't feel like we need to take them away. All I'm saying is that I feel that we also need to put some resources into researching a new avenue, something that we haven't thought of that can address an issue that we see has been persistent. And the data has shown in other cities around the US and many studies have been conducted that this approach has worked and it works for people who do not at first want to interact and come back into society and take on all of these like 
programs, but they, most of them do end up staying in the housing. They do end up finding jobs. It has worked, and I am saying that I feel like we need to divert at least some of our resources into further researching this and seeing if it can be properly implemented into Temecula to address an area that all of the things that we have proposed today aren't necessarily targeting or addressing. I believe we're almost missing the elephant in the room because when we think about homelessness, we think about, oh, give them a home, which is a fine idea for most, but the biggest problem within homelessness is substance abuse and drug addiction. And throughout cities that have several homeless shelters, such as Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, they still have a very uh, prominent, if not an even more prominent, homeless problem and burden than we, than we do. And the point is, is that even though they have homeless shelters, some homeless families and homeless couples that live on the street refuse to even go to the homeless shelters because they have, in those homeless shelters, there are still people that do substance abuse, who have drug addiction. It is, it's just attacking one problem, but the biggest problem is drug addiction. And the way that you solve that is through providing more specialists in community health centers. We have right now eight uh, uh, community health clinics in or around Temecula that only have behavioral health specialists. What we need are to implement drug addiction and substance abuse specialists in those community health centers. So then when a person, a single mom who is addicted to a certain drug or uh, a, young, a young person who is addicted to a certain drug can go into those clinics freely without being ashamed and get the help that they need. Because if you just give them a house, that's one, one problem. And to be honest, it's, it's a little problem compared to the overarching idea on why they continue to behave this way, and that is because of drugs. Mayor Zani, with all due respect, I agree. I understand that this, that is one of the main problems, but what I'm saying that we need to address is that these people who are chronically homeless and who aren't seeking out substance abuse help and all these things that they need, it's because they won't. The ways that we're doing things, like the way that it works for all these other people who may be in and out of homeless who are suffering with all these things, they take up that help. They go through the programs, they are willing to, but what I'm trying to say is that we need to look into other avenues that will target these people who maybe initially are not willing to, who are not going to take this traditional route. So I, that's what I'm trying to say here. And I believe completely in what you're saying, that substance abuse, mental health, all of these things are big issues, and we need to 100% focus on them. And the Housing First strategy isn't a traditional homeless shelter. And it's also, we've proven that we're not like city, like big cities like LA and San Francisco. Temecula is incredibly different. We have a loving community who is here, and we're all willing to support and help one another. I'm saying that we as Temecula maybe need to look out of the scope of what we've already done, continue what we're doing, strengthen our programs, but maybe expand them and look at something a little bit different to target an issue that we still see as something prevalent and present and that our community members constantly notice. Um, to add on to that, I believe Mayor Ziani and I completely understand what you were saying initially. We were just building off of that, like you were saying, new avenues, which is what we both mentioned. Um, in terms of that, we were saying that giving them a house isn't going to be the main solution to that, and we understand that you were saying that as well. But um, in that circumstance, she's also looking from the county perspective as a whole too, not just Temecula. We are part of the Riverside County, and in addition to that, there are multiple outreach programs and homeless shelters within that that can serve as an avenue to start. And if we just give them a house simply, it will not solve the issue because mental illness and the stigma around all those other issues and contribution to substance abuse and drug addiction, those are the issues that need to be tackled as well, in addition to poverty. And there are numerous reasons behind that that can add up to the additional um, uprise of the homelessness that could be um, the populace on that. However, what you were saying with the housing and to just initially give them a house in some circumstances, it may not be the best avenue to go with, and that may not be the best new avenue to start with, because, um, and I disagree with what, um, with all respect, I disagree with what Councilmember Smith was saying, because um, the, the conditions aren't necessarily like, oh, it's inhumane to be like, well, here's this homeless shelter that you can go to. There's multiple resources out there that are all very humane that can help them um, get off their, like, get on their feet and move on with what they were currently doing, 
in addition to multiple outreach programs to uh, a company that following the issue of substance abuse and drug addiction. Um, so overall, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with your viewpoint with all respect. Um, I'd just like to say, I think we do all agree on one point and it's just kind of getting muddled in this. We all agree that we need to stop and we need to focus our efforts, at least some of our efforts on stopping the flow of new homeless and chronic homeless people. We're just disagreeing on what to do with the homeless people that we have right now. And I mean, I think we all have the best intentions in mind. It's just something that we will need to come back to and um, come back and after further research and further discussion, uh, I believe that we can come to an agreement. I agree that we can come to an agreement, but there are a few things that I believe still need discussion, especially with, we've talked about, um, I guess, integrating the youth into this problem. Um, however, we haven't talked about how we're going to prevent uh, the youth of Temecula and the youth of Riverside County from becoming a part of the homeless population. And um, Council Member Rodriguez and I have come up with an idea that uh, she talked about a little bit um, ago about implementing programs, uh, and I believe implementing a uh, class throughout public high schools for senior year on, of, of, of a financial literacy class that would uh, train um, young individuals on not only how to pay their taxes, but how to be financially literate and how to save money, uh, what bank accounts save money. Because for me especially, when I was filling out my college applications, when I was doing everything that had to do with financial uh, aspects, my parents did that. I didn't know anything about uh, their tax returns, about their, the different bank accounts. And to be honest, as seniors and as the youth of Temecula, we should have some you know, whereabouts of, uh, uh, of our financial situation. And again, that brings us back to my point earlier, how people that graduate high school or graduate college especially become homeless because they were not trained how to be financially literate. Um, so it doesn't come with giving people a house. It comes with being proactive and teaching the youth of America how to uh, not get into the homeless situation in the first place. And that comes with uh, reducing the stigma around drugs and uh, increasing the amount of uh, community health centers that have substance abuse specialists. Um, and uh, mandating a program or a class throughout high school, um, preferably senior year, about financial literacy. We I, I mean, we know all about biology and chemistry, but I don't know how to pay my taxes. I don't know how to fill out my FAFSA. I don't know the vast majority about how to start um, my financial life. And that should be a staple of uh, American education, American public education. So I um, agree that we should um, uh, perhaps think about giving people a home later after we've solved the two uh, biggest problems, financial illiteracy and substance abuse. And just a quick comment to add on to that. Um, I agree with Mayor Ziani and it, the house idea comes later First, um, I believe that the reformation within the education and within the career technical education aspect is something that comes first, and that is the first avenue that we have to deal with rather than simply handing someone a house in that terms. With all due respect, I don't think an extra class is necessary for high schoolers to take. We can get our financial literacy from our parents and just learning from our father figures, mother figures, whether it be an uncle, aunt, grandmother, grandpa, because they do have to pay taxes and do all that financial stuff, and we can learn from them instead of having to take an extra class. With all due respect, uh, Councilman uh, Henderson, there are a vast majority of lower income uh, families and children who do not have uh, stable parents to ask them those questions, or maybe they do, but they do not have the relationship um, a strong enough parent, uh, daughter, or parent, son relationship to ask those questions. Um, so again, 
we need as a state and as a local government to uh, mandate some sort of program that could perhaps even be a unit in economics or in uh, uh, AP government or government classes that talk about personal financial literacy. Because without that, we're not tackling the problem. We're talking about giving people homes, which to be honest, is not, is not going to solve the problem. It's by being proactive about homelessness and providing people with um, uh, knowledge on how to be financially literate and how to be open and reduce the stigma around substance abuse so people can get the help that they need. And to add on to that, in my personal experience, um, currently I'm in a class which is called Advanced Financial Algebra. That class is a course which teaches its students to, um, in a way, be financially responsible. It opens us up to the um, background within finances. And to add on to that, I think that overall um, the educational system is probably one of the avenues that we need to take a look at too. And we need to understand that we should be teaching our youth and we should be teaching our high schoolers that there is an, that is the avenue we need to take because there is a place for them in this world that they shouldn't feel like they have to turn to drugs or substance abuse, that they shouldn't um, be put in that position because there is a place for everybody. And in accordance to that, um, to add on to that, um, there are multiple ways that they can go about after they, they graduate high school, like Mayor Ziani was saying earlier, rather than um, having to face that difficulty and having to go through the struggle of um, poverty or even uh, falling into the homelessness epidemic in a way. Um, there's multiple options out there. College isn't for everyone, but there's, there's additional things. There's community college, there's college, there's vocational schools, trade schools, um, and that is what the CTE, and which is the Career Technical Education Pathway, can provide for those students because, like she said, um, not all students have parents, not all students have those figures in their life to teach them that. And some of them are living in those conditions where it's, they're, in a, they're in a position where they don't have access to that. So with, um, with the reformation and starting with that within our communities and within our state and on the federal level of our education, that is where it begins. That is where we start to, uh, to make that change and to further produce that into the future and to propel that from where it is right now. Um, that, that change starts with us. That change starts with that avenue of where our education starts, um, how we are raised, and things like that that incorporate into it is what is ultimately going to be the biggest factor in determining um, what we do in our lives because there, there's something, there, there is something for everyone. I would like to say that I agree wholeheartedly with this. I also would like to mention that homelessness is a holistic issue. It involves both the front end and the back end. But from the front end, I completely agree with the idea of education and that not all of us, as many of us may be here, but not all of us are privileged enough to have family members or parents or like mentor figures that are there to teach us about financial literacy, about our plans and options after high school. And I do think it's important that we extend the knowledge of plans after high school beyond just college. Like we definitely have a college and career day, but we mostly see colleges there. And there's just a lot of kids in high school who don't necessarily see themselves going to a four-year college. And there's a lot of stigma behind CTE pathways sometimes that shouldn't be there there shouldn't be a divide between the oh you guys are the kids that finish all your a through g's or you're the ap kids who are going to go off to college and we are the cte kids or we're the kids that are going to go to community college they're both incredible options and the point is having a plan after high school it doesn't matter what your plan is it's just the fact that you have one and it's there for you so i do agree that we need to educate our high schoolers more i think this needs to start even at a middle school level of just like showing people what is out there and that there's multiple avenues that you can take we need to address mental health we need to address substance abuse abuse from a way that really reaches youth instead of it coming from the top down of like an adult figure coming and saying drugs are bad maybe speaking about how Drugs are like drugs are something that you're always going to see, and they may seem like a great option in the beginning, but they're not. And having someone who's going to honestly have a genuine and open conversation with them, we need to create mentor programs that connect youth that maybe are at risk or don't have those parental figures in the life in their life with people who are older and able to guide them and maybe have gone through similar things that they have. So, okay, we're going to go ahead. Um, I am entertaining an idea of perhaps passing a motion to uh, talk about this further in our, in our next meeting. Um, excuse me, Ms. Mayor, if I may interject. Yes. Um, the topic of financial literacy as a class 
in public schools is more of like a school district issue mm -hmm. rather than a city issue. And also, just to let you guys be aware that the city um, has summer courses in youth development here that deal with topics of financial literacy. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, shifting focus to um, promote that more in public schools. Yeah. And then there is also a school board and city council meeting coming up that if you want to talk about those topics there, that would be a good place to further address the issue. And are those programs optional or are they mandated? I believe um, they're optional. They're optional programs. Okay, so that kind of goes back to the point on the people that need that class the most perhaps aren't going to take that opportunity. Right. But I do, obviously it is a district issue, mm -hmm. so perhaps we can entertain the idea of passing a motion that asks the school board to put that on their on their agenda of perhaps going and talking about the financial literacy. Yes. Okay, we have a question. Um, so I just wanted to add on to what um, city manager Miss Henningsen said, um, but last night I actually attended the school board meeting and during the recognitions portion, they recognized the Assistance League of Temecula for actually um, providing a financial literacy class to, I think it was like 149 students um, this past year. Um, so just when you brought that idea up, you know how many of the regular government, maybe like the non-AP government classes, they um, make a requirement that you have, I know at SHAP you have to um, attend either a school board meeting or a city council meeting for hours. So instead, couldn't you add that as an option? So instead of embedding that into the the core system, you could always give them another option from that. But I do know instead of, if that um, another option would be asking Assistance League or other outside organizations to like provide that too, because that's an option. That is a very good option. Um, and since we are almost running out of time, we perhaps can, uh, again, entertain the idea of passing a motion that uh, puts that on our next um, agenda for our next meeting and also asks the school board to do the same so we can tackle this issue proactively. Um, does anybody have some last minute comments before we move on to the city manager's report? Um, I just want to clarify yes. before we finish that, along with the recommendations put forth by the staff mm -hmm. reports, you guys are suggesting workshops and additions in public education, not only to raise awareness on drug abuse, but financial literacy, um, as well as trying to combat issues of youth homelessness. That is what the council is recommending, along with the recommendations that have already been put forth. Mm -hmm. And with that drug program, it's all about reducing the stigma around drugs. So then if someone does have a drug problem, they don't feel ashamed to come forward with it. So um, it's not really just drugs are bad, it's drugs are bad, but you know, if you have a problem, definitely come forward. Does anybody have any last minute comments before we move on? Okay, all right. So we are now gonna go ahead and move on to the city manager's report. Um, yes. Before we do that, yes, you guys need to take a stance on the recommendations that we're yes, for. Yes, thank you. Anybody want to take it? I'll second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> All opposed? Okay. All right. And the motion has passed. Uh, now we are really moving on to the city manager's report. <laughs> Um, okay, so first I just wanted to say that Chaparral's improv team has their first show of the semester um, on Thursday, February 13th, and also Chaparral's annual Mr. Puma competition that showcases our senior boys' talents is on March 7th and is open to anyone in the community. And lastly, I just wanted to say thank you to Mr. Sol for this opportunity, and thank you to Aaron and Greg for teaching me all about how to be a city manager. Oh, and I believe my assistant city manager also has a report to give. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank the city of Temecula for giving us students this amazing opportunity to see how local government operates. 
I think I speak for all the students here when I say that this experience has been very educational and rewarding. I, for one, have gained greater respect for uh, local government, and I take greater pride in being a Temecula citizen. Thank you for all that you do to support our local community and to keep our city beautiful. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Does anybody before we adjourn the meeting want to state anything that had to do with our problem with homelessness or something like that? Give their input. Okay, well with that being said, I adjourn this meeting at 11.40 a.m. All right, well, it looks like all 21 students are here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Our mayor, Mayor Pertem, and council member are also here. We might have one more council member joining us a little bit later on. Um, so welcome, welcome to Youth in Government 2020. We are so glad that you guys are here. Um, and teachers, again, thank you for participating. Um, uh, hopefully this February timeline works out better for everybody. So um, we'll continue to, to hopefully in future years do it maybe the third week in February. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just straight, straight away turn it over to our mayor, James Stewart, for some Introductory remarks, followed by Mayor Pro Tem Edwards and Council Member Schwenk. Well, again, thank you all for participating in this because this is really a cool event for us as city officials and even uh, uh, city workers to actually see you guys wanting to get involved. And really, this is the first step in getting involved in government, you know, and I applaud you guys for being willing to actually step up to the plate and see what we do and the decisions we have to make. And some of them aren't easy. So, um, and you're gonna find out even with this topic, it's a very complicated topic. So um, I'm kind of excited to see what you guys come up with because it's, it's something that we could actually probably glean some information from too. So again, thank you all for participating because this really is um, probably our cool event of the year for us. So uh, we enjoy seeing you guys and seeing you guys how you think. So, and, uh, and we, we almost every single year we walk away thinking, if that's our future, we're golden. So thank you all. Marianne. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I'm a little hoarse because there was a football game last weekend on television, and I happen to be from Kansas City, so... Yes, and I saw them lose the first two Super Bowls to Green Bay back, oh, I don't know, 100 years ago, so I was this big, but anyway. So we are thrilled that you're here today, and this is one of the things that we look forward to all year, and I'm going to steal a part of uh, Superintendent Ritter's speech that he gives at Student of the Month every month, and he says, I know you're excited about being here, and I know you're going to be focused on your roles and what you're doing but I want you to take enough time to stop and look around and realize what you're doing today because it's a very, very special opportunity. I think it's one that you're going to remember. Students always tell us they're going to remember this the rest of their lives because it really does put you in the position um, you know, that you're going to um, be assigned to today. And you're responsible for that position. So, And it's up to us to be good teachers and staff to teach you. Um, but we only have this morning and tomorrow morning, so it's definitely gonna be a crash course, but we all love what we do so much that it's easy for us to you know, explain and, and pass on the rules and the policies and procedures. Temecula is wonderful, and the fact that you are interested in doing this, whether you wanna stay home and do this at home later on, or whether you wanna go out into the bigger world and do the same thing. It's always good to know how local government works because it's the closest government to the people and you really get to see the changes that you make. So it's very gratifying. So we're so excited to have you here today, and I'll probably be hoarse the rest of the day, so it's okay. Thank you, Marianne. Um, I think one of the things that I love most about this is um, seeing some familiar faces over the years. You see you sort of grow up through our city, and this is just that next evolution of, of what you're doing for our community. So I see quite a few faces that I have seen over the years in our community. Um, 
And I just really like that. I appreciate that. Um, today will be a, a very informative day for, for everyone, including us. Um, and just that, that this is just sort of the beginning, really, for you, of your civic involvement. I think you're going on to college and, and, and then come back and, and stay involved. And, and I like the diverse group that we have here today. We have a nice mix of boys and girls. If we can sustain that and uh, keep that involvement through the years, I, I think that's really important because you look when you sort of you go to the next level. Um, Marianne is, is the only woman council member here in Temecula, and I think we need to change that. I think we need to, we need to uh, elevate that status. <laughs> Did I say that wrong? We need to add more. Um, because I think that's important, and, and so today I use that as, that as that stepping stone to college and being civically involved in leadership roles in our community, and you truly are the future. So welcome, and I'm looking forward to the next two days. Thank you. All right. How about a round of applause for all our council members? Okay. So we're going to kick this off with an election, um, and I am going to need a volunteer to go ahead and um, be the city clerk uh, with me, conduct the election, help me conduct the program over the next couple of days. So is anybody interested in being the city clerk and running the program and running the election? Okay, don't make me... I didn't. Okay, so, so my name is Randy Joel. I am the legislative director and the city clerk for the city of Temecula. In that um, realm, I work on elections, I work on um, um, uh, assembly bills, Senate bills, legislative procedures. I get to do all kinds of cool uh, special projects for the, um, for the uh, city manager and for the city council. Um, I do have my JD. I don't practice law uh, very intentionally. Um, and so, um, And I get to run really cool programs like this. So um, that's pretty much an overview. But is anybody interested in the elections arena, in the political campaigning arena, any of those kinds of things? OK, so I saw your hand go up. I saw your hand go up. I saw your hand go up. Um, so how about, um, uh, I'll just uh, think of a number 1 through 10, and I'll just tell Zach, and we'll go with it from there. A number? Okay. A number? Okay. I was seven. <laughs> All right. Welcome, Madam City Clerk. All right. So if you want to go ahead and get on up in your name? Shelby. Shelby. Okay. Welcome, Shelby. So Shelby, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and call our council candidates up. We actually have, um, I believe, 11 council candidates. Um, we had... Uh, Six and... Oh, yeah. you don't want to run for council? You'd rather be a city clerk than yeah. council? Oh, good choice. Um, okay, so we will go ahead, and when we pass out the ballots, we'll go ahead and, and take that out. So essentially what you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and call these names one at a time, and they're going to be able to come up and provide their, uh, their candidate speech, and then you can just skip over you. Bryce Alberg. Ooh, why is it fancy? Is this thing on? All right, all right. Uh, hello, my name is Bryce Andrew Alberg, and today I will be running for city council. I grew up in Temecula my whole life, and living here, I have seen the growth of several communities. But the biggest community that I have seen growing is actually the homeless community. And I think that's a problem, because what follows homelessness follows health issues, uh, higher crime rates, and a large uh, advance of people being under the influence in public. So I think one of the biggest things that I would work on is the homeless community, trying to get them off the streets, whether through shelters or through stricter police enforcement or law enforcement. My other priority would be the streets of Temecula. The most dangerous weapon available to the masses is automobiles. And if we don't take care of our roads, then those automobiles have a higher chance of crashes, either through potholes or through different 
bad, like the lining bad striping is what it's called. Uh, so yeah, those are what, that's what I would focus on if I were on city council. Thank you. Juliana Duran. All right, so I did prepare a little something. So, hi, my name is Juliana Duran, and I'm a senior at Chaparral. And before I moved to Temecula, I grew up in a very different city, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So it was a lot bigger than here, and I had to adjust when coming to Temecula. But what made it really easy was the immense sense of community that I got from moving here. I'm sure most of us agree that Temecula has a great sense of togetherness, where we really support one another and everyone here. So I got to experience this great sense of community firsthand this summer when I interned with one of our local nonprofits, Michelle's Place. Not only did I grow a lot as an organizer and learn the process behind running a nonprofit, but I got to interact with people all over Temecula. From going to Rotary meetings where I learned about the homelessness task force that we have, and I got to speak at a lunch event for the city for Michelle's Place, and even attended a Temecula Enterprise meeting. I saw, our community work, I saw how our community works closely together in support of local businesses and our people. As a city council member, I will passionately support outreach programs to build our community network between our businesses and our nonprofits and our community members. I will make sure everyone feels supported in our community, no matter socioeconomic standing or background. I will continue to grow our support networks, and this is why I want to be in city council. Thank you. Ryan Henderson. Hello there, I'm Ryan Henderson from Great Oak High School, and uh, I can read your minds. I know what you're all thinking right now. You're all thinking, why should I vote for this random dude from Great Oak High School? And well, the answer is, you really shouldn't, because if you get down to it, this is a two-day government insight where we get to learn about the inner workings of our local government and how wonderful it is to be a politician in our local government. And each of us come from different high schools, from Chaparral, TV, and Great Oak. And each of us have no idea who everyone else is. We're all just a bunch of random people brought here to work in Temecula and be a uni ah, city council. So what I aim to do here is I aim to get to know everyone. By the end of this, I will know all your names. And I will know what your favorite food is and what your favorite place in Temecula is. And that's why you should probably vote for me. Thank you. Charlene Misiano. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlene Misiano, and I am a senior at Chaparral High School. Um, being Filipino, having a community that you feel like you're a part of and nurturing those in that community are two very, very important things to me. Um, so much so that my fellow ASB officers and I have made it our goal to create a more safe and inclusive environment at CHS through various changes in our school culture. And we have been advocating for a campus that um, prioritizes empathy, acceptance, and unity. And this is something that I wish to bring to the larger community of the city of Temecula. Um, being ASB president, I know, um, or I've had much experience working with a large um, organization of people, delegating responsibilities, and holding weekly PO meetings to discuss the financial and just overall needs of our campus. And, but not only that, um, I've used this position as an opportunity to get to know a lot of my peers, not just upperclassmen, but underclassmen as well. And that is also something that I wish to do to you all. Um, 
But that being said, I've also been a part of the Youth Adversary Council here um, at the city of Temecula for two years, which was really fun because we got, to do, we got to be a part of the Homelessness Task Force to learn about the issue of homelessness in Temecula. And my personal favorite, having monthly holiday parties with special needs children and their families, which was very humbling and very fun. Um, but overall, I wish to be part of the city council or be a part of the city council um, because I believe every voice deserves to be heard and that we should all feel safe in a community that we can succeed in. So thank you. Veronica Nguyen. So hey guys, I'm Veronica Nguyen. And I would like to be um, on the council because I am not only very involved in the community, I am the president of the Youth Advisory Council. So what that means is we work with those with special needs, not only children, but adults as well. And I'm also, and every summer I volunteer at our local's summer day camp as a, one of the junior counselors. So this kind of shows that I'm very involved in the community and I would like to help reach, help those with Oh, sorry, I would like to help the children of our community and those with special needs to create an environment where they can feel like they're ho at home and for those children with like with broken homes to feel like there's someone out there to take care of them even though we're not family by blood, but there's someone out there who cares and will love them as much as their own parents will. Thank you. Molly Reagan. Good morning, uh, my name is Molly Regan and today I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself and my passion for Temecula. So I've been living in Temecula my entire life, which is 17 years. Um, I've grown up knowing the benefits of a community like Temecula, which include what makes up part of my childhood, like the swing in cafe or going to trips to penny pickles with my family and friends and having to learn the true history of Temecula. Also knowing the beauty of wine country and driving to school in the morning and seeing those hot air balloons up above Temecula Sense of Community thrives off of what there is to do here and the activities and restaurants and life make up our city. If I were elected, I would want to bring in more tourism into Temecula. I think what we have to offer is something people would want to come and visit and see while maintaining the historic traditions of Temecula. Increasing the tourism would help create more jobs in our community and I believe that an increase in employment for Temecula will better sustain the lives of our citizens. I know what Temecula has to offer, you know what Temecula has to offer, but what would it do for our nation if they knew what Temecula has to offer? Vanessa Rodriguez. Good morning, my name is Vanessa Rodriguez and I attend Great Oak High School here in Temecula. Um, growing up, my parents came from backgrounds where they are from strong Hispanic families uh, within their bloodlines. And because of that, they lived in Northern California and Mendota and Fireball where the farming community, and it was a very small town. and. Um, as soon as they got out of high school, they got married at the age of 18 years old. And to take care of my family, my father joined the United States Navy. Um, witnessing his career growing up, that is something that is very um, influential to me. It became something that I am extremely passionate about. And he has served in the United States Navy for 20 years, and now he is retired. And seeing his service to our country, it really influenced me to serve our community and our country. Therefore, when I moved to Temecula in 2016, um, entering high school, I automatically felt welcome because this beautiful city was something that I could really just be part of. And um, within that, within my freshman year, I joined the Air Force Junior ROTC program at Great Oak High School. And I've had the opportunity, which is just so amazing to me, to be a part of this community and be a part of something that's bigger than myself and serve those around me. And due to my commitment in the program, I have been fortunate enough to be selected as the unit commander for the program this year, which is a large leadership role where I assume responsibility over 180 cadets, which is 180 of my peers at Great Oak. And having been in that leadership role, I feel that I can demonstrate um, excellent leadership and teamwork skills, as well as collaboration. And that is just something I am extremely passionate about. And even after um, I graduate from Great Oak, I wish to pursue a career in the military like my father did, serve as an officer, and then be involved with um, government and possibly come back and be involved with our local government because this city has given me so much. And because of that, I'm just very fortunate for that. So thank you. Rebecca Salazar.
Good morning. My name is Rebecca Salazar. I'm a senior at Great Oak High School. Let's start off with this. This program is about highlighting the voices and the potential of the young, about giving us an opportunity to begin the long journey that will eventually become our full-fledged careers, and about opening a window to the house of all civilization, government. Not just government, but local government. The thing which Valerie Jurett once referred to as looking into the eyes and the hearts of the people. As a first generation Mexican American, Temecula has been my safe haven and the source of my growth. Most significantly, it's led me to find a deep passion in the value of young people's voices, critical thinking, and the ability to communicate, most especially through institutions like speech and debate, coaching, leading, and participating, and youth court, which is rooted in ending the school to prison pipeline in the state of California. Because of this, I believe I'm capable of representing us all in the context of city council. As we step into adulthood, we deserve to be seen as we are, as intelligent, competent, and determined people. A vote for me is a vote for us all. Thank you. Phil San Angelo. Hello, my name is Phil San Angelo. Old traditions and new opportunities is our city motto and it's a high mantle to live up to. As Temecula is one of the fastest growing cities in the state, it's up to us to decide what kind of opportunities we're going to provide for all of those who join us in our community. And also, it's up to us to determine what traditions that we want to hold dear. The tradition of community, the tradition of faith, the tradition of love for one's neighbor. This is why you should elect me. I, as someone who has served both with the Andrew Yang campaign, with speech and debate and model UN and leadership positions, I am someone who is committed to fighting for these traditions and fighting for these opportunities, and also to fight for a future for Temecula, to see Temecula grow into a community which will, inher which will inherit the traditions of older generations, as well as provide for the welfare and prosperity of all who live here. As someone who has competed in competitive debate at the regional and state level, I am someone who is completely able to fight for those changes, to see the issues in our community and to resolve them so that all of us, all of us who have lived here for years or even decades can see a community that we can be so proud of and look forward into the future. Thank you. Jacob Schmidt. Uh, well, first, I'd like to start off by thanking everyone here today. Uh, you've given us a great opportunity, students from all three of our Temecula High Schools, to go out and kind of explore this different aspect of life that we don't necessarily get to see all the time. So, a little bit about me. Um, my whole family basically come from this civil service background. Grandfather served in the armed forces and was actually part of law enforcement. Grandmother, Linda Krupa, serves on the Hemet City Council. <laughs> yeah. And uh, my mom served back, back east. She was an intern back east with um, the different law-making organizations. And this has kind of influenced me in a way that I didn't really see at first. Um, okay. Uh, so I'm our SAD president at our school. So SAD youth advocacy group that we go out and do different things. One of the things I've been most proud of with that group is I've worked alongside SAD Speaks, which is our group that works with the legislative aspects and makes laws back in DC that helps with um, youth health and different ideas like that. Um, this year's my first year in ASB, which is another part of our aspect that I've had kind of taken into this. But the one thing that I really wanted to end up running and didn't necessarily prepare a speech for is it's something that I'm actually researching. So I'm writing a paper this year dealing with polarization in our city council. And when Mr. Slow came up to me with the proposition of this youth leadership thing today, I was like, hey, this is a really awesome opportunity to go ahead and meet this council members, talk to them, get a little bit of insight, and kind of pr uh, propel my research to this next level. So today, a lot of people, they've had this, these awesome speeches, and um, I can't imagine to top them, but the one thing that I would like to do if I am elected 
is to learn, is to find these new aspects, is to get this insider, I guess, insider look on what it means to be and run a city. And if you guys would allow me, I'd love to do that. Thank you. Layla Ziani. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Layla Ziani and I am a senior at Great Oak High School. So just some background on me. I was born in France in the city of Marseille in the south to an Arab father and a European mother. So I came to Temecula about 12 years ago and I had a thick French accent. I didn't speak that much English and I was able to learn English and lose my accent and really assimilate into this awesome American culture. And I really want to pride that for so many other immigrants that are coming to the United States and especially to our community um, that they are able to assimilate and become just like one another. Um, but now into the substance of my policy platform. As a council member, not only would I offer a more international perspective to the council, but I will prioritize three things. Number one, education. I go to Great Oak High School, and the only two languages they offer there are French and Spanish, and the French program is very weak. So, as a city council member, I will prioritize that we expand our world language department in all three high schools, all three public high schools, as well as encourage private and charter schools to do the same. Second, um, my second priority will be business, especially small business. I want to cut taxes for small businesses so that they are able to maximize their productivity and also maximize their job growth as well. And then third is environment. I want to create more job opportunities for people coming into Temecula from other communities or from our own citizens that are currently unemployed by revamping our uh, economy from a now from a fossil fuel based economy to now a renewable based economy. So my three things as my platform for you to vote for me as a city council member, education, uh, jobs, and climate. Thank you so much. All right, so if we can have all of the candidates go ahead and go up in front of the podium again one more time. And we're gonna have you um, Share your names one more time so the, everybody that's voting can make sure that they're putting the name to the face. Okay, if you guys want to grab the microphone and just start from one end and just let everybody know again your names. Hi, I'm Juliana Duran. Hi, I'm Charlene Missiano. Hi, I'm Molly Regan. Bryce Andrew Alberg. Jacob Schmidt. Vanessa Rodriguez. Layla Ziani, Veronica Wynn, Rebecca Salazar, Phil San Angelo, Ryan Henderson. <laughs> All right. We're going to go ahead, if you guys want to have a seat, we're going to go ahead and pass out the ballots. There are pens up on the table next to the podium in case you need them. And you're going to go ahead. On each of these ballots, you're going to get one ballot, and you're going to vote for no more than five, okay? No more than five. We have five council members, so no more than five. You don't have to exhaust all your votes if you do not want to. That is true for real voting, and that is true for youth and government voting as well. So, um, but if you are passionate that you only want to vote for one or two people, you can go ahead and do that, or you can go ahead and vote for all five. Shelby, if you want to go ahead and pass out the ballots and after you go ahead and mark your ballots there's a little box up front on the table there next to the podium just go ahead and put your ballot in there and Shelby I'll leave your ballot right here so you can still vote So in real life, in the election space now, you can actually 
take a picture of your ballot and post it on social media if you wish. Um, before, this process was rather closed, but as of two years ago, there's, there's a new law that allows you to do it if you wanted to do that. So. And then once you're done, go ahead and put your ballot in the box. All right, are we just about done here? Okay. Anybody else? That looks like ballot stuffing, young man. <laughs> Got a stack of ballots there. Um, all right, so anybody else? Last chance. All right, so Shelby and I are going to go ahead and tabulate the votes, and then we're going to go ahead and share the results for, with you. In the meantime, we're going to have each council member share a little something about what they like being about um, a council member. Um, and in, in real life, as you guys may know, the city of Temecula is now in districts. So we have five districts. Um, council member Stu represents um, district, our mayor represents District 4, Marianne Edwards represents District 3, Zach Schwenk represents District 5, which is actually my district, um, and District 1 is uh, Matt Ron, District 2 is Mike Nagar. So in real life, from a nomination standpoint, if you wanted to run for council, you would actually go ahead and um, be issued nomination papers, and then you would need to go ahead and you have to be a registered voter in your district, and you would go out and collect no less than 20 no more than 30 signatures of registered voters in your district to go ahead and run. Um, it's a small amount. It's, most people can go ahead and meet that threshold. Um, we would verify signatures and go ahead and qualify you, and at that point you can start your campaigning and raising money and all that kind of good stuff. But for youth and government purposes, we are going to go ahead and select the council members based on the highest vote getters. Um, and if there's a tie, we have a process for that as well. So... Um, Mayor Stewart, if you would like to share a little something. Sure. Okay, just a little bit about all of you who ran for city council and aren't going to get it. I ran three times. So I ran first in 2006, and I ran a campaign. It cost me $800 total, and that was with a filing fee and everything. <laughs> and I got the highest number of votes ever by a, a non-city councilman and not win. So literally, I, I got like 9,722 votes, to be exact. And then um, I ran again in 2008. Same thing, only this time, everybody was telling me the first time, you got to spend money, Stu, you got to spend money. So I raised like $10,000, got about 10,800 votes. Again, the highest vote total ever for a non-incumbent or uh, anybody, and still not win. I'm on a roll. So I ended up getting on the Rancho Water District Board, did that for four years, and then I ran for city council in 2016, and I decided I'm going to revert back to my original. Spend no money. I literally, I spent, I think the filing fee was $800, and then I spent about $450 on Facebook ads. And I won. So... Right. So, so I had name recognition by then, but I, you know, I literally been a barber in town for 28 years. So a lot of people knew me just from the barber shop. But so I had a little bit of an edge, but nonetheless, don't give up. If you if you really want to do this job, keep going, keep trying, because eventually you'll hit it or you'll find something else that you like along the way. So um, that's my encouragement to you guys is if you decide to get into government at any level and you really want to do it, do it. I mean, don't, don't say because you failed once that it's over, I'm done. 
if you really want to do it, push again, push again, and eventually you will get it. I mean, our, we're watching the election cycle for the president right now, and there's a whole bunch of people who keep wanting it and keep pushing, and who knows, maybe one day they'll get it too. So, um, so I just encourage you guys all to just, uh, and that's my favorite part about being city councilman too, is, is the fact that you know, a lot of people do know me and a lot of people do see um, how impactful I am, especially as a new city councilman. I mean, I'm still in my first term. I get, I'm up for re-election this fall. So, um, so this is still my first term. So it's, it's pretty exciting and super exciting to be mayor, by the way. Um, but I mean, with, with all the glory comes all the heat. So anything that happens on the city council, they look at the mayor as like, you're the guy that's doing it to me. So, so you gotta be able to take that heat too. So it's, it's, it's a pressure job too. It's not something that's all glory and fun. So you gotta make sure you're ready for that too. So we'll let Marianne give her long history of city councilwoman. That's why there's no room on city council. She keeps sucking the air out of the room. Well, heck, heck yes. When you love what you do, it shows, you know. So I've lived in Temecula 31 years, so before it was even a city. So we saw what was happening to the city and the negative impacts that the county of Riverside was having on our city by approving tens of thousands of building permits but not requiring the developers to build any infrastructure. No roads, no parks, no amenities, no nothing. And so we decided to become a city so that we could control our own destiny. And we've done, I think the councils have done a wonderful job really since the beginning uh, Temecula is beautiful, safe, clean. We're one of the safest cities in the nation. Um, immaculately clean. If you get to drive around to other cities very often, it just doesn't look like Temecula. Um, we take pride in literally everything we do, and we always, our motto is do the best we can every single time. So, you know, if you're going to build something, build the absolute best that it can be. And you have to think ahead to do this. When we built City Hall, we looked ahead to, you know, like we said it would last 150 years. So we know that Temecula will probably grow again. We're almost built out, so our growth is nearly finished. But we're being petitioned by areas outside the city. They want to become part of the city. And we know that'll probably happen someday. Uh, so we accommodated those future jobs here at City Hall. So um, City Hall is here and ready to, um, you know, be filled up with future employees. And that could be 10, 15, 30, 50 years from now. So um, after 30 years, you know, when we first moved here, all three of our children went through, all through Temecula schools. Go Bears. So um, I remember when Great Oak High School was built, I was on the school board when they built Great Oak High School. And I remember when Chaparral High School was built. So um, we've come a long way at the school district also. Um, I volunteered for everything because that's what you did in Temecula. I've served on probably 20, 25 nonprofit boards or as a member of nonprofits just working for the community. And I always tell people, if you volunteer enough, you'll become the mayor. So I knew a lot of people in a lot of different spheres, you know, the health community, um, the church community, PTA, those kinds of things, school district. And people started asking me to run. Um, because I came to every council meeting anyway. We loved it. We loved the council members. And there wasn't all that much to do in Temecula in the early days, so the council was kind of like our entertainment. <laughs> so um, I did run, and I lost my first election also. But I lost it by 149 votes. It was very, very close. So after that, I was asked, somebody approached me and said, you know, you're so busy in school. Why don't you run for the school board? Well, I didn't know. It's hard to lose. It is hard to lose, but... You stay in it, and you try again. And I won the school board election with the most votes in the history of school board elections. And that was a wonderful experience. So um, after that, I was actually appointed to the council. I was a city commissioner also in there someplace. But I was appointed to the council when Senator Jeff Stone left office here to become Riverside County Supervisor. And they had to fill that seat. Because of my commission experience, my volunteer experience, and my school district experience, the friends on the council that I'd known for years and years felt comfortable appointing me to fill that seat. And I hit the ground running because I was still attending all the council meetings. So, you know, when you love your city, it shows in everything that you do. And we really do love our city, and we love the fact that you're here. And I love hearing the fact that you love it, too. So we're going to have a great time today.
Madam City Clerk, I believe we have some results. Um, our mayor this year is Mayor Layla Ziani. So, do you want me to call them up? up here? And then, can you come to the front? And then our mayor pro tem is Juliana Duran. Our three council members are Ryan Henderson, Vanessa Rodriguez, and Jacob Schmidt. I'm going to start with our mayor. Oh, yeah. Um, raise your right hand. Um, repeat after me. I state your name. I, Layla Ziani, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance, that I will bear true faith and allegiance, and uh, to the Constitution of the United States, to the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, that I will take this, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation Without any, mental reservation, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Council members, if you want to get your stuff and go ahead and sit up on the dais, the middle five seats there. And now we're going to go ahead and assign the roles for, or draw for the roles for the balance of the executive team and staff. Um, but before we do that, so you guys have an idea of what everyone does, we're going to go ahead and invite up the, the directors, um, and starting with our um, illustrious city manager, Aaron Adams and then just kind of go ahead and, and go through staff. And they'll tell you a little bit about themselves and a little bit about uh, what their purview is here at the city of Temecula. Congratulations on your election, city council. Um, good morning, my name's Aaron Adams. I have the privilege of, of being the city manager. Um, I've worked for the city for 25 years. I started as an intern. You look well. Yeah, thank you. Um, and it's been an awesome uh, career, awesome learning opportunity, but you may not know what a city manager does, so let me just give you a little bit of job description. So if you want to compare it to, I'll get out of your frame here, if you want to compare it to the, public, the private sector, the city manager is, really serves um, as the CEO of the city. Um, you work directly for the mayor and city council, so you're in a binding employment contract, and this is your board of directors, okay? Um, the city manager is ultimately responsible for all of the operations and maintenance and personnel um, that goes on in the city, and you are the policy advisor to the mayor and the city council, so everything kind of funnels through you. You have, in my case, I have an amazing team around me, and you're, and you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. And so you'll hear from them a little bit later on. Um, and, uh, and those jobs will be available as well, okay? Um, but the city manager is a, uh, no two days are ever the same. I can guarantee you that. Um, we're dealing with policy recommendations that go up, but you're also dealing day to day with um, all of the operations and maintenance of the city. And so that's kind of with the staff, at the staff level. So um, as a city manager, I applaud you for being here today. It warms my heart to see young people that have an interest in local government. Unless curriculum's changed, I don't think you get a heavy dose of local government in high school. You probably study state and federal government. So 
maybe we can teach you a few things over the next day and a half, and maybe, just maybe, some of you might leave here with an interest in studying public administration or getting into local government and maybe becoming a city manager or in a local government job. So welcome, enjoy the next day and a half, and uh, let's go, and go, go Bears, because I'm a Golden Bear dad too, so. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everybody. My name is Greg Butler. I'm the assistant city manager, so put the business community back on. I would be the chief operating officer, if you will. Um, we do whatever Aaron wants us to do. Um, but essentially, Aaron and I uh, oversee all the different departments, make sure they have what they need to function and operate and deliver the will of the elected city council members. Um, We'll actually, in practice, get to do what my job is here to do because when he's gone, I'm the one in charge. He's leaving today, so whoever's the city manager, we're all going to take over tomorrow after he's gone and we'll give everybody a day off. <laughs> no. No? Oh, all right. Um, but like I said, uh, I've been working here oh, coming up on 21 years now. One of the things you'll find as you get to meet many of the staff members here is we enjoy a long tenured staff. And what that does for us is it gives us consistency. We've had consistency at the elected official level, which helps both Aaron and I do our jobs easily. We have a good sense of what the council members' thought processes are, what their expectations of us are. Uh, and so it's nice to work in that environment. And the other thing that we really enjoy here is this is a work family. What you'll find is the city of Temecula, in my opinion, is, is unique in that we have a, a work family here. If you think about it, you spend more time at your employment place than you do at home. Uh, you're working here eight, nine, 10 hours a day. Council days will be here 12, 15 hours. Uh, you go home, you sleep, and you come back to this family. And the only thing you've done is said, hey, good morning, and back to the work family. So I look forward uh, to meeting each and every one of you. Uh, I think we've got a good topic for you. And as Stu said, we hope to learn a little bit from you, see what your thoughts are uh, on the subject matter, and look forward to working with you the next couple of days. Who's next? There we go. Let's see. First one I see, Damien. <laughs> I'm Damien Petrick. Uh, I'm the assistant director of uh, information technology. So uh, our job is to make sure all the computers that you see uh, on the dais here and throughout the city, uh, we've got over 400 computers that uh, operate every day, printers, faxes, servers, uh, storage, all that stuff. We make sure it's working so that the rest of the staff can uh, get their jobs done. So uh, that's what I do here at the city. Hello, hello. Good morning. I'm Kevin Hawkins. I think if we were continuing, um, I guess, with the private sector, I would be the director of fun. <laughs> right? So um, I'm the director of community services. Um, I think I've been here about seven years um, in that capacity. I've been in uh, the public sector, uh, local government, well, before all of you were born, so uh, for a while. Um, community services. Well, I think in listening to some of the speeches, um, you've all been touched by community services. Um, if you live, work, or play here, you know about community services. Um, our mission, if you will, is to improve the quality of life through a complement of programs, services, events, activities here in Temecula. So that will involve our youth, our teens, our seniors, our special needs population, our homeless, and our veteran community as well. So in a traditional sense, I'm sure you've been to one of our parks. You probably have been in some of our programs, um, Little League, um, aquatics, maybe our special events, a parade, the rod run, maybe our special games, or dealing with our special needs population, or one of our veterans events, or You've, and I've heard, um, or YAC, or Youth Advisory Council, I've heard that too. 
and some of our homeless outreach. That's community services. So I guess in wrapping up, the other thing that I wanted to leave with you is that our department, which is very diverse and comprised of professionals with different backgrounds, skill sets, um, we believe that good is the enemy of great. And so you're going to hear a lot from, from the other departments. Um, they protect the city. They plan the city. Um, they do a great job of maintaining the city. And the city is very good. It's a good city if we just limit it to just that. I submit that what community services provides is the difference between being a good city and a great city. Maybe the difference between you who are 3.8 to 4.2 students in the schools that you want to get into, they're, lo they're looking for a little bit more than just excellent grades. They're looking for volunteerism, they're looking for social impact, service to the community, how can you make a difference? And that's what community services is about. We provide that difference that makes us a great city. Looking forward to seeing you for the next two days. Hello. Luke. Morning, everybody. Morning. My name is Luke Watson. I am the director of community development. Um, I've been at the city, started my 15th year last month, so a long time. I'm also a uh, alumni of Temeca Valley High School, right on, class of 2000. So this is my 20-year reunion year, actually. So uh, that's wow. exciting. I'm not sure. Yeah, it does. Huh? Maybe I should keep that to myself. But <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, been here a long time. Um, biased about this community. Obviously, if you do the math, uh, I went to school at San Diego State, got out, came to work here, been here ever since. And no regrets at all. Love working here. Also grew up here, so it's kind of a uh, you know, double whammy in that respect. So um, like I said, Director of Community Development, what does community development mean? Um, you know, a lot of people don't know what that means. And the best metaphor I have for community development is it's, a, it's like a conveyor belt. Um, um, you know, we're, we're, we're taking the council's vision and we're implementing it all the way to uh, you know, how, the, how the community is actually physically built. So, it's, it's really about land use. We're talking about the physical buildings, where things are built. That's concept of zoning, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with, residential, commercial, industrial, where things actually get built or allowed to be built in the community, but also uh, what uses can take place there. So in commercial land use, some commercial land uses are allowed and some commercial land uses aren't. So what actual activities take place in the buildings? That's really the primary function of community development. And that kind of takes place, like I said, on a conveyor belt. We'll take the council's vision and we'll make a general plan out of that. And that's the underlying document for the entire city, not just in land use, but for every policy uh, that the council has uh, adopted. It goes into the general plan and then we'll take that and we'll send it over to our long range planners. So that's your urban planners, right? That's Sim City. That's the kind of let's look out into the future where do we want things to go? How do we implement the, the council's vision in a broad, citywide aspect? So that will get completed, and then we'll move it on over to our current planners who are going to be dealing with individual projects. So, you know, a, a housing track comes in. They want to build somewhere. They would come into the current planners, and they would check it against the general plan, the project against the general plan, and say, hey, is it checking off all the boxes? Is it, is it meeting all the requirements? And if so, it would, it would get approval. And then from there, it would move over to the building department. In the building departments, where they're checking the actual plans, make sure the uh, Americans with, uh, uh, American with Disabilities Act is being followed, and you know it's, it's a safe uh, building. And then they would issue a building permit, and they would construct it. And then after that, the final step is code enforcement. Code enforcement are, is a, a, a team of individuals that goes out and makes sure that what was approved to be built is, is actually built, and that the uses that are going on inside that building are the uses that were approved to go on inside that building, that everything ties back to the general plan from the very beginning. So that's, that's kind of community development in a, in a nutshell. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated department. Um, it's kind of, um, it's, it's not community services, and so it's not the fun department. But you will find yourself at the center of most important issues in the city, right at the center, and controversial even. 
issues. So it's a, it's a highly impactful department. So if that's what you're looking for, I think community development is the right department for you. All right. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Jennifer Hennessy, and I'm the director of finance. So we deal with all things money. Uh, we do all of the accounting for the city, uh, issue payroll, accounts payable. We receive all the monies coming in, issue business licenses in the cashiering area. Um, and we also do the city's budget. So we coordinate with all of the departments to pr produce the annual budget as well as a five-year capital improvement budget. So we do all that. Um, it takes you know, a good part of about five months to actually get through all of the steps and get all the information um, analyzed and prepared. And then that's eventually presented to the city council who adopts the budget. And that's a, uh, that's a cool part of the job because we get to work with every single department at all different levels. Um, you get to know all of the different cool projects that Luke was talking about, and you'll meet public works director here in a moment, but a lot of the projects that go around in the city, the, the, the roads, the parks, all of that cool stuff. Um, so you get to touch a little bit of every, every part of the city, so it's pretty exciting to do all that, as well as you get to work with money all day long. So um, with that, I'll give it to Pat. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pat Thomas. I'm the Public Works Director and City Engineer. And so my background is in engineering, civil engineering. So anybody who is interested in uh, pursuing a career in engineering may want to talk to me. Um, so the Public Works Department at the city, what we do is we basically build and maintain the city's infrastructure. So the roads and the parks and the buildings that the city, the city hall was built here as a project under the Public Works Department. Um, so we, we manage the construction of city projects as well as maintain all of the city's facilities. So I heard somebody mention uh, roads as being one of their issues. So if you're interested in roads and traffic, you may want to see, you know, may, may want to be uh, the public works director today. Um, but uh, um, so, so that's what public works does. We do, uh, we do the planning and design of the infrastructure, uh, manage construction projects, and then maintenance. So we have a uh, we have crews that do road maintenance, that do parks maintenance, and do facilities maintenance for all the city's infrastructure. But uh, as a couple of the other uh, uh, department has mentioned also, the, the city departments all work together. So we work very closely with the community development department, with Luke's department, as far as new development projects that are being planned. The public works department's looking at the infrastructure that goes along with those, with, with those development projects. We work closely with the finance department, Jennifer's department who oversees the money, because we're the spenders of the money and she's the holder of the money, so we have to work together with, with the finance department. So um, all the city departments, and you'll find this out when you get assigned to your department, really work together in many aspects. It's a well-oiled machine, the city works uh, and operates very well. All the department's heads uh, working with uh, Aaron and Greg all work very well together. It's a well-oiled machine. And, and as you'll see when you get your assignment of the department that you're going to work with, we will be working with the other departments too in the, in the issue that you'll be studying today. So you'll get a chance to see what each individual department does as well as what the organization does as a whole. And as like I said, as you'll see, I think it's, it's a really... Uh, a very uh, fine-tuned machine that the city uh, provides all the services here for uh, for Temecula. So, uh, let's see, Isaac, Human Resources. Good morning. So my name is Isaac Garibay. I'm over Human Resources, Risk Management, and Emergency Management. Um, like Luke, uh, I'm walking into my 20th year anniversary, or what is it called, reunion? Uh, but been in public sector since uh, 2003, so 17 years as of yesterday. Um, all in human resources and risk management. And here, um, the highlights of that is recruitment and selection. Um, so making sure that we hire and retain the most talented workforce. Um, and that's what you see in this room as they're summarizing what they do. The, these are top-notch people. 
So you're gonna have an opportunity to work with some really talented people. Um, in risk management, that some of the highlights are defending lawsuits against the city. Uh, emergency management, we wanna make sure we're prepared to navigate uh, disasters and other emergencies and recover from that properly. Um, so those are some of the highlights, but since we're uh, more of an internally facing department, there's not really a direct role for today, so you won't have the opportunity to shadow me today. We want to make good use of your time, but happy to share what we do. Okay. Thank you. Zach. Good morning, everybody. My name is Zach Hall. I'm the, I sit as the police chief here in the city of Temecula, but I have a unique role as a contracted employee. So I'm a sheriff's captain and the commander of the Southwest Station. But like I said, I also sit as the chief of police here on the uh, executive team. Uh, we have a sheriff's station out by French Valley Airport that serves the city of Temecula and the entire surrounding county area. So about 200 employees out of that facility. Uh, we operate as a paramilitary organization in the Sheriff's Department, where I sit as the commander of the station. I have a command staff of lieutenants. We have a supervision team of sergeants. We have a handful of detectives, shift leads that are corporals. We have deputies that patrol the streets. And then we have a cadre of support staff from sheriff service officers, community service officers, and clerical staff uh, that assist in that role. Um, besides all of that, uh, we have a full complement of SWAT officers, aviation, canines. Within our station, we have our robbery suppression teams, burglary suppression teams, narcotic officers, vice officers, problem-oriented policing officers, hot team, homeless outreach team. So we have a full-service police department and law enforcement organization that services this entire community. So uh, one of you will be assigned to us today, and we will take you over to the station and show you how we conduct business. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Brad Cassidy. I'm one of the battalion chiefs here for the city of Temecula. Um, same as the police chief just said, we are paramilitary as well. Um, we do have a fire chief. He is not here right now. Um, I serve as one of two battalion chiefs. And for that, what we do is we have a twofold. We have an operational side and we have an administration side. So operationally right now, I'm in charge of five city fire stations and then three outlining fire stations. So a total of 91 people are in charge, uh, is what I oversee right now. Anytime that we have any type of an incident that requires a battalion chief or uh, say a traffic accident, any type of fire, whether it be a house fire or a grass fire up in the hills, I'm gonna have to be the one that's gonna go to that and manage that and then control it. Um, on the other side of it, we have the administrative side, which means we have to look at the budgets. We have a false alarm ordinance that we have here. We also have the uh, fire marshal here in the city of Temecula that oversees all of the plan checks for all the new buildings to make sure that we're meeting all the fire codes and everything else. Um, I've been here since, I've been back three times now, once as a firefighter back in 1989. I came back as a captain on our ladder truck here in Temecula, was here for seven more years, and then I just came back five years ago as one of the battalion chiefs and I ended up retiring here. It's, I'm getting there, huh? I think I got it after three times, so. Uh, it's a great city to work for. Uh, one of you will be assigned to us in the fire department side of it, and uh, we'll see where we go. So thank you very much. Hi, my name is Michael Heslin. I'm the IT director for the city, and our role is primarily internal support to our departments. We do all things technology, so we provide the tools that provide better information to the decision makers, as well as citizen engagement for online services, all e-government initiatives, and we do this through a host of multiple divisions, uh, media services, all your audiovisual. Uh, geographic information systems, all your mapping components, uh, network and infrastructure, tech support, <laughs> software systems. Um, we just provide a array, array of tools, um, including surveillance and security to the police department and just a number of things out there. 
all technology-wise. Thank you. I think that covers everybody. All right, so we're going to go ahead. You guys heard a little bit about all the different departments. We're going to do this in a real democratic fashion. You're going to pick a slip out of a cup. Um, and that is how this is going to work. The first year I actually did this, I, I wanted to be really inclusive and take into consideration um, what you all wanted to be until I had five students that wanted to be the police chief and five students that wanted to be the fire chief. So um, given our time constraints, this is, this is what we do now. Um, so you're going to come up. You're going to pick a slip. Um, I'm going to ask you to say your name. And I'm going to go ahead and read the title so that our city clerk can go ahead and make a notation of it. And then we're going to ask you to go ahead um, um, in those particular departments, if you can kind of just like wave, um, you can go ahead and sit with your particular um, assigned department. And then we're going to give you some instructions before we let you go. So um, in no particular order. If you students want to go ahead and start coming on up here, and I'm going to go ahead and... Molly. Molly. Molly, your last name? Regan. Molly Regan. Molly Regan. Just pick a slip. Only one. Police lieutenant. Police oh, lieutenant. So they're in the back there. Madam City Clerk, you got it? Okay. Your name? Rebecca Salazar. Rebecca Salazar. Information technology. Information technology. Michael is back there. Phil San Angelo. Okay. Fire Chief. Fire Chief. They're over there. Veronica Wynn. Veronica. IT Director. Oh, IT Director. IT Director back there. Your name? Maddie Hauser. Maddie. Assistant City Manager. Bryce Solberg, Community Services Superintendent. Okay, so Community Services. Name? Zach Danbury. Okay, Zach. Community Development Planner. Community Development Planner, okay, so Luke over there. Justin Edwards. Okay, hi, Justin. <laughs> Fire Captain. Fire Captain, come right over there. I'm Alex Rosen. Public Works Engineer. Public Works Engineer, right there. Amir and Pat. Your name? Christian Bowen. Christian. Community Development Director. All right, Fund Director, right there. Oh, no. Look, yeah, look. kind of Fund Director, too. Look, yeah, look. <laughs> Your name? <laughs> Ryan Geller. <laughs> Ryan? Hey, Ryan. Public Works Director. Kate Henningsen. Kate. City manager. Sweet! Oh. City manager. Charlene Messiano. Charlene. Finance director. Finance director. Jennifer. Name? Cameron Eckel. Hey. Police chief. Police chief. Oh, so Zach back there. And last but certainly not least. Kaylee Daniels Garber. Kaylee. Community Services Director. Community Yay. Fund Director, right there. All right, so before you guys take off, I need to give you a little, some instructions. So, um, so basically, we have time for a tour. So you're welcome to students and um, directors. Go ahead and take your students for a tour of City Hall. Um, so this, keep in mind, um, so can we get everyone's attention, please? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to do a Greg thing. One, two, three, eyes on me. So, um, okay, so your topic is homelessness. Your directors have a roster that kind of gives them an idea of what segment of the topic of homelessness you guys are all going to be writing a joint report on. 
Those, you will need to start those reports today in each of your departments, and you probably will be meeting either outside of um, this setting or maybe via email or whatever you guys come up with. Tomorrow morning, all of your reports are due to um, community development, and they're serving as the lead department, and PowerPoints as well. So that agenda, for tomorrow, we are strictly adhering to that. So no, there's no deadline, you know, mixes or anything else. So um, we will be coming around to each of the departments. Um, tomorrow, we will have a two-hour mock city council meeting starting promptly at 10, because you guys will need that time to go ahead and discuss. So again, we'll be coming around. Your directors have been through this before. They know what's up. Um, at 12 o'clock, we will be meeting in the conference center. Um, at that time, we'll go ahead and do lunch, and we'll do an overview of ethics. Um, so um, again, go ahead and do your tour, meet up with your department, start your reports, and then we'll see you at noon in the conference center. Thank you.